If uh, people could take their seats, we'll get started on this hearing. I'll call the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology to order and welcome uh, our distinguished panel of uh, Chairman and the Federal Communication Commission Commissioners. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, Chairman Wheeler. Commissioners, thank you all for joining us. I want to start this morning with two points of personal privilege. First, would you all join me in wishing, wishing Commissioner Clyburn a very joyous and happy birthday. Yeah. Not every day you turn 30, <laughs> including today, but oh well. <laughs> We, we, we know you think of it as a present to be here with us today. <laughs> Thank you for your great service to the country, and may you have many, many more uh, wonderful birthdays ahead, <laughs> not necessarily celebrated with us. Um, second, today is the last hearing that my good friend uh, of nearly 30 years, an extraordinary counselor, Ray Baum, will serve as a member of our committee staff. Fate would have it, our parents were friends back in the 30s. Ray and I won back the seats that our fathers had both held and both had been defeated by Democrats in. <coughs> when we were elected to the Oregon legislature in 1988, he followed me as House Majority Leader and then later served as a member of the Oregon Public Utility Commissioner appointed by a Democrat governor. And then another Democrat governor appointed him to serve as chairman of the Public Utility Commission. Um, and he served as the chair of the uh, state, federal state joint board on universal service as well. Really exciting topic. If anybody wants to get deeply into, Ray can take you there. He's given us more than the five years he committed when I convinced him and his wife to come to Washington, and I hope we all wish him well as he begins a new journey with the broadcasters. Ray, thanks for de decades of strong, fair, and effective public service for Oregonians and all Americans. Godspeed on your new journey. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I, I would yield to my friend from California. I thank the chairman. Uh, we all wish Ray abs the absolute best uh, because he's given his best here. Uh, he's always been a gentleman. He's a public policy expert. He has given his all to the committee and during times when it was difficult for him to do that uh, because he was uh, battling something in terms of his health, uh, but he never missed a beat. And I call that real dedication. Uh, dedication to uh, not only our, our committee and the work and the responsibilities of this committee, uh, but ultimately for the American people. Uh, so God bless you, Ray. Um, we're going to miss you a great deal. Thank you for everything that you've done uh, on behalf of all of us. The gentleman from New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ray, Ray, this is a surprise to me, sir, but um, I also had the honor of working with Ray Baum and learning from Ray Baum uh, back when he was a utility commissioner and I was on the New Mexico Commission as well. And it's been an honor working with you, uh, Ray. Um, many successes and look forward to continued work with you. you you're, you're a great, great person and you truly are an asset to America. Uh, look forward to learning from you and working with you in your future endeavors. Thank you. Now on to our hearing. Uh, we're entering what will uh, most likely be, if tradition holds, the final chapter in the history of the FCC under Chairman Wheeler's leadership. As the record clearly shows, while we've worked together on many public policy issues, we've also been at odds at times on process and policy. Uh, while the Commission began with a commitment to reform the agency from within, we know that the Commission has implemented only half of the recommendations of the 2014 FCC Process Reform Working Group. This is why I believe true reforms require changes in law that can transcend any particular chairman or any particular commission. The public deserves no less. Unfortunately, sharp divisions within the commission are widely reported. With the rapidly changing communications marketplace, we've never needed this independent agency to work together for the public interest more than now. And I have to admit there are times when I've expressed my displeasure with the FCC's actions and its failure to adhere to the will and intent of Congress. For example, notwithstanding passage of the bipartisan legislation requiring that, joint, that existing JSAs be grandfathered uh, from the FCC's controversial revisions to the ownership rules, the FCC's Media Bureau recently terminated a JSA in spite of this restriction 
evoking a strong bipartisan rebuke. And the recent Senate report on how uh, the Chairman and General Counsel uh, capitulated to the White House demands and uh, regarding net neutrality uh, proceedings illustrates without question the willingness of agency leadership to uh, subvert what I would call fair and open process uh, to political pressure from the White House. Uh, but that's not all. I'm concerned about the FCC's actions regarding set-top boxes and what that means for copyrighted programming and consumer privacy. While the FCC has wrapped its proposal in pro-competition and pro-consumer bunting, a broad range of stakeholders, including content providers, program distributors, large and small, and civil rights groups, have uh, emerged pointing out that the proposal raises serious concerns about its downside. I'm sure you'll hear more about that from our other committee members today. Meanwhile, uh, the chairman has circulated a proposal to impose privacy rules on ISPs modeled on those uh, for the old telephone network. Instead of making the proposal public for all to see, all the public gets is a fact sheet. Words matter, to quote uh, others on this committee. Mr. Chairman, I call on you to make that proposal available for all to see, including uh, the commissioners to comment upon, and, uh, and I think that would be helpful and important. And the chairman has circulated his plan to expand the Lifeline program to subsidize mobile and fixed broadband Internet access and contemplates increasing spending by $750 million. Again, because this proposal is not public, we have only the FCC's fact sheet to guide our understanding. While it appears the chairman has proposed a budget mechanism, certainly a necessary step, and reforms uh, to combat waste, fraud, and abuse, which we support going after all of that, the devil is in the details as to whether they are meaningful details which we cannot see until the item is adopted and released. Notably absent from the FCC's marketing materials is a discussion of the financial impact of the proposal on the families that pay each month through fees on their phone bills to support the program. These are all significant matters that will define how we communicate for years to come. It will not serve the American people if they are resolved in a manner that ignores opposing views, discredits opposing input on its face, and gives short shrift to collaboration in favor of expediency. Good process, openness, transparency, accountability, honest policy debate, and compromise are the catalyst for balanced, sustainable outcomes. Finally, let me end with this. If all goes as planned, and it appears that it will, the incentive auction will begin on March 29th, and I commend the Commission and its staff and uh, the chairman for moving this process along. It's been a very difficult uh, road, never traveled before. I consider the legislation that got us here some of the most important work to have come out of our subcommittee, legislation that reflected broad bipartisan agreement reached through debate and compromise. I think it's something we can all be proud of. We all hope the auction is a success, and of course, only time will tell. Mr. Chairman, you have recognized this is only the beginning of a very complex endeavor. I was pleased to see that your staff has already turned to the post-auction repack issues. There are, of course, controversies about the sufficiency of the 39-month timeline and the $1.75 billion set-aside fund uh, to fund it. In addition, I remain concerned about keeping translators and low-power television stations on the air as appropriate under the rules. I remind the FCC of the age-old requirement that licensed stations supersede unlicensed uses of broadcast spectrum. Know that we take these issues seriously, and I know you do, and we'll continue to work closely with you and your teams uh, as this phase of the post-auction uh, proceeds to make sure that the intent of the law is followed and that free over-the-air broadcast programming is not adversely affected. Uh, again, thank you for your good work on the auction. I, I guess I've used up all the time I had. So with that, I would recognize the gentlelady from California for opening remarks, and again, thank the chairman and the commission for the work you do and for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you, and uh, welcome back uh, to uh, the chairman and each of the commissioners. It's been four months uh, since you've been here. Uh, I think that you have made optimum use of the four months uh, since uh, you were last here because there are a series of actions uh, that are being taken up at the commission uh, that I think put consumers first, strengthen competition, and advance innovation. At the top of that list, uh, is the agency's vote last month that will make it easier for consumers to buy a set-top box or an app from someone other than their cable company. This technology-neutral proposal means that any company will be able to manufacture a set-top box or design an app uh, and sell it to consumers. Should a consumer wish to continue renting their set-top box from their pay TV provider, they can. 
uh, no one's going to take it away from them. I don't know if there's that much of a love affair with this set-top box, but if they want it, they can keep it. Uh, very importantly, the uh, FCC's proposal is an opportunity uh, to enhance access to independent and minority programming, giving consumers the ability uh, to choose between set-top boxes or apps with improved uh, search functionality and user interfaces. Nearly 50 years ago, the FCC took action to give consumers choice as to whether they wanted to rent their landline telephone from Ma Bell. Consumers not only saved money, but innovation thrived in the telephone market. Uh, the FCC is also busy in its efforts to modernize its Lifeline uh, program to make broadband more affordable to low-income Americans. This has long been the goal of um, I, I think the entire committee, uh, certainly huge support on our side of the aisle. Under the proposal to be voted on next week, for the first time ever, for the first time ever, low-income consumers will be able to use uh, the $9.25 uh, per month lifeline support towards standalone broadband service. Access to broadband is the 21st century's lifeline, providing a pathway to jobs, education, health care, and so much more. The FCC's action uh, will further our nation's progress toward bridging the digital divide that has really haunted our country. We have looked for ways, talked about it, uh, dreamed about it, hoped for it, uh, and I think that this is a major step forward uh, of uh, reaching the goal, the President's goal of bringing high-speed broadband to 20 million more Americans by 2020. And in just a matter of days, the FCC will be begin the world's first uh, voluntary incentive uh, spectrum auction. Uh, and uh, uh, with global mobile traffic expected to increase nearly eightfold, eightfold between 2015 and 2020, and wireless carriers taking steps to deploy 5G, I think it's critical that we continue efforts to free up more spectrum for both licensed and unlicensed use. At the same time, the FCC will take critical action at, at its March meeting to protect the privacy of broadband consumers. Efforts to continue to reform the special access mark. And Mr. Chairman, I hope this is just closed down, done, accomplished by the end of this year. Uh, transition to next gen 911 and ensuring the internet remains open and accessible to all Americans. None of these are small tasks. Uh, but taken together, not only individually, but taken together, I think that this will um, uh, leave a, uh, a remarkable imprimatur on the country uh, of this commission's uh, work. So I thank you. I look forward to a lively discussion and questions that you're going to be asked. And again, uh, thank you for being here and the work that you're doing, and I yield back. General yields back the balance for time. Chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the distinguished gentleman from well, thank Michigan, you. Mr. Upton. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to echo the words uh, for Ray Baum, and I, I would say that uh, with apologies to the rest of the staff, I don't know of a more professional, uh, hardworking leader than we've had in Ray over the last uh, five years. Uh, he has helped set the standard. We work as a team on both sides of the aisle. Yes, of course, we disagree from time to time on certain issues, but we are not disagreeable, and he has set that bar, and we really appreciate his very hard work and uh, knew about his background before, and he's been an integral cog uh, in all that we've done, and we all appreciate that friendship uh, and professionalism from day one. Uh, Chairman Wheeler and members of this committee, uh, welcome back for sure. Uh, last November, the House did pass by a voice vote, H.R. 2583, the FCC Process Reform Act, a testament of our bipartisan commitment to solidify the FCC as a model of openness, transparency, and collegiality. This committee has pursued FCC process reform on a bipartisan basis going back to the 112th Congress, and I am proud of our continued efforts to improve the function and transparency of our government. Underscoring the need for this legislation are, of course, the continued reports of process failures and divisive partisanship at the FCC. The FCC is the steward of one of the, the most vibrant and innovative sectors of our national economy. Significant matters remain before it, and the stakes are certainly high. The communications and technology sectors are among our nation's most precious economic assets, the pinnacle of innovation, and something that we should be rightly 
so proud of. Given the stakes, two of our FCC's most recent proposals are cause for concern. The chairman recently presented his colleagues with a proposal to impose new requirements on the video subscription market and a new privacy regime for Internet service providers. These proposals have the potential to harm the very sectors that they are attempting to preserve and stimulate. The Commission should look with a skeptical eye at calls to regulate part of a market at the request of com competitors. And as the Chairman seeks to implement what is likely the final year of his agenda, it is no less important now that matters are, dis are addressed through a process that is open and transparent, informed through robust debate, and resolved through bipartisan compromise. These were procedures that once set the FCC apart and should be returned to. It is only through this approach that we can avoid uncertainty and threat to investments, and I yield uh, to Mr. Latta, Blackburn, and Kramer. Well, th I appreciate the chairman for uh, yielding, and I also want to thank the uh, commission for being with us today. I'm always continually amazed by the success and the productivity of the communications and technology industry. This dynamic sector is a bright spot in our economy as it rapidly advances and evolves to meet consumer demands. Given the Federal Communications Commission's integral role in this marketplace, it is critical that Congress monitor its regulatory policies that impact the industry's success. With that said, I'm concerned with some of the actions proposed emerging from the Commission. Take, for instance, the, the set-top box notice proposed rulemaking, which seeks to replace the failed cable card regime with yet another government-dictated standard. When Congressman Green and I worked together to get our bill language inserted into Stellar to eliminate the integration ban, we intended to rid the marketplace of an outdated technological mandate. However, rather than allowing consumer demands and competitions to shape the industry, the FCC has placed it upon itself to inhibit the future of pay TV with unnecessary government involvement. The NPRM will surely impede innovation and limit consumer choice. With that, I look forward to today's hearing, and I will yield back to the chairman. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. We are appreciative of the commissioner's time in coming here before us this morning. There are concerns, as you have heard, from some of the policies that you have moved forward with, net neutrality, municipal broadband, the actions that were taken in North Carolina and Tennessee on muni broadband were so radical, even DOJ didn't support what you were doing. We also have concerns uh, pertaining to all vid and the lessening of the protections that are there for patent holders and copyrights. So uh, lots to discuss today, so we thank you for your time and your preparation in being here, and I yield to Mr. Kramer. Thank you for yielding, and thank you to all three of you. I, I guess I would just associate myself as much as anything with the chairman of the full committee and, and the chairman of the subcommittee and, and put a finer point perhaps on the set-top box rule. While I have all the same concerns they have, I have a, a special particular concern about its impact, the disproportionate impact it would have on smaller video providers, rural video providers, and a number of us are always looking out for the smar smaller rural providers. Um, and then I would just add one other I issue, and that is that I continue to hear from my, especially my rural telephone cooperatives of call dropping issues. And if maybe after the hearing somebody could hook up with my staff, I'd like to get the latest from you all. Because we just heard from Tyler Kildee of, of Griggs County, for example. They're having as many as five complaints a, a month, and that still seems awfully high, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. And I love Ray, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, too, served as a public service commissioner. He was a legend then, too. <laughs> Thank the gentleman for his comments, and uh, all time has been consumed. So now we go to the, uh, chair, uh, the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Poloner, New Jersey, for opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also Ranking Member Eshoo, and, and thank you to all five commissioners for testifying today. Anyone who thought the FCC would slow down this year certainly underestimated the agency. The Commission has teed up an impressive number of important issues, including the incentive auction set to launch next week. The auction counts as one of the most ambitious efforts the agency has ever undertaken. The airwaves that can be freed up through this auction, both licensed and unlicensed, will ensure consumers feel the full power of the mobile revolution. But as important as it is to help consumers of mobile services, the auction can also be considered successful if it works for broadcast viewers as well. Back in New Jersey, we understand the importance of a seamless transition after the auction because disasters like Hurricane Sandy can strike at any time, and when they do, viewers depend on their local broadcasters. 
Fortunately, all five FCC commissioners have committed to ensuring viewers do not lose signal as a result of the repacking process. That's why I drafted the Viewer Protection Act to give them all the tools they need to keep this commitment. This bill will prevent viewers' TVs from going dark while also ensuring consumers of mobile broadband benefit from the incentive auction as soon as possible. Hurricane Sandy also showed the importance of phones in an emergency. When the hurricane hit New Jersey, we did not just watch our TVs or listen to our radios, but we also looked to our mobile phones. Unfortunately, too many of those devices let us down when we needed them most. And that's why I introduced the Sandy Act so that we are better prepared the next time disaster strikes. The Sandy Act has a number of common sense proposals to improve access to communications in a disaster. For instance, the Sandy Act would help ensure that customers of any wireless carrier can get signal even if their own carrier service goes down. No one should be left without any bars on their phone when the compatible network is still working. The bill would also create a database of critical personnel to keep public safety officials and the carriers in better touch during an emergency when every second counts. I've been in close contact with both Chairman Wheeler and the carriers to talk about how to get this done, and I want to thank them both for taking these issues so seriously. I'm optimistic that we're close to a breakthrough that will put us in a better position for when the next disaster strikes. And again, I thank the Chairman, uh, Ms. Eshoo, and the Commissioners for being here today. I uh, look forward to today's discussion. I have about two and a half minutes left. I'd like to split that between Mr. Doyle and Mr. Butterfield and yield first to Mr. Doyle. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you yielding to me, and I want to thank the Chairman for holding the hearing and to our witnesses. Uh, this is like deja vu all over again. You these guys are here all the time. <laughs> but welcome back. We're glad to see you. Um, the Lifeline program connects millions of people around the country to their only source of communication. And I just wanted to take a minute to congratulate Commissioner Clyburn for her leadership on this issue and the efforts of the full commission to modernize this program and bring it into the 21st century. Uh, I also want to commend the commission on moving forward on broadband privacy reform. I agree that it's critical for FCC rules to be updated to suit our modern needs and that these rules recognize the privileged position ISPs hold in acting as gatekeepers to the rest of the Internet. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have to say, and I'll be happy to yield back to you so you can yield to our other colleague. I'll yield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank well, you. It's just a matter of time, Greg. Oh, my God. <laughs> you started out all right. I'll, um, I'll yield the rest of the time to Mr. Butterfield. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Pallone. Uh, uh, let it be said that our colleague from Pennsylvania set a record today. Thank you, Mike Doyle. I thought, I thought you were going to eat up all of that time. Uh, but, but thank you, uh, Mr. Pallone. Uh, let me uh, begin by sharing with my colleagues and thanking the commissioners for their incredible work, and thank you uh, for coming today. Uh, I join my uh, many other colleagues in applauding the Commission for expanding the Lifeline program to subsidize broadband services. But I'm afraid one of the unintended consequences of the current proposal will be the creation of a copay requirement on low income participants of Lifeline, as well as a phase out of voice only. And so, Mr. Chairman, I urge the Commission to preserve a no charge option for Lifeline participants who may not be able to afford even a modest copay and to maintain a voice only option. It is crucial, it is crucial for lifeline beneficiaries in my congressional district and across the country that the expansion of program to include broadband will not be at the expense of essential voice services. Regarding the set top box proposal, I'm also concerned with the potential for myriad unintended consequences like many of those raised in the op-ed written by Henry Waxman, including the ability to enforce copyright protections for content creators and distributors as well as the potential uh, negative impact the proposal could have on diversity and inclusion of minority voices. Along with other stakeholders, uh, I am concerned that the proposal could lead to a new form of digital redlining. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to include three items into the record. Very briefly, the first letter is addressed to Chairman Wheeler, signed by 10 civil rights organizations, urging the Commission to postpone the set-top box proceeding until a study can be conducted. Second is an op-ed from our good friend Henry Waxman that cautions the Commission to explore the myriad 
unintended consequences that could arise from the set-top box proposal. Finally, the third is a copy of comments filed by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which urges the Commission to not require any, any cost sharing in order to participate in the Lifeline program because evidence uh, shows that doing so would dampen low-income households' ability w to participate. Thank you. Without and objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back and I thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. All time's expired for opening statements. I <laughs> want to again welcome the Chairman and the Commissioners here this morning. And uh, Chairman Wheeler, obviously we're going to start with you this morning. Uh, welcome back and uh, we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the... But we would ask you to pull that microphone pretty close. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, start off with uh, the topic that you, many of you were addressing, and that's the uh, upcoming spectrum auction. Um, it's only going to be a week. Is it not coming through? Yeah, you got to get it really close. Really close. There you go. You know, I've seldom been accused of not projecting, and I will. Uh, <laughs> I will. Uh, one <coughs> one week from today, the green flag goes down on the incentive spectrum auction. As the committee has noted, this is the first time it's been tried in the world. Uh, this committee developed the authorizing statute, and you all have been very involved in the intervening years as the pieces of the puzzle were being built. I would be terribly remiss if I didn't mention the incredible work of Gary Epstein and the Incentive Auction Task Force at the FCC in this regard. Gary and Howard Simons, along with an A-plus team, have wrestled with issues that no one ever before has had to deal with and have brought us to the threshold of this historic auction. Now, <clears throat> many have asked about the impact of the D.C. Circuit's decision that Latina Broadcasting should be provisionally certified to participate in the auction. That decision will not delay the March 29th start date for participating broadcasters to make their initial commitments. After March 29, as we always planned, the auction team will analyze the initial commitments and calculate the initial clearing target. We had said this process would take three to four weeks. The late hour inclusion of Latina will require us to update our data files and ensure that the auction, that this auction system is properly functioning with the updated data prior to circulating the initial clearing target. Staff is working through the operational effects of including Latina so that we can make those updates. But we have always planned the auction bidding in the reverse auction will begin in May, and we still expect that will happen. Insofar as the forward auction in which the wireless carriers participate, we will proceed with the previously announced schedule. There are 104 parties that have expressed interest a 50% increase over the number of qualified bidders in the record-setting AWS 3 auction. Of course, not all applicants may become qualified bidders, but we're currently working with them and plan to have a final list by April 6th. The forward auction, of course, will follow the close of the reverse auction. In the coming weeks, we will continue our bidder education and training activities so that both reverse and forward auction bidders have plenty of time to become familiar with the bidding systems before their respective auctions begin. We are finally at the point where we move from the theoretical to the real world. For months, various hypotheses have been put forward predicting one effect or another to happen in the auction. Next week, the wisdom of this committee in creating a marketplace that will begin to deliver market-driven decisions to replace all those studies and theories with real marketplace conclusions will begin. I look forward to discussing this and other issues with you today, but before I conclude, I want to once again reiterate the need for Congress to become involved in the ability of next generation 911 to protect Americans. 
21st century life saving is being blocked by the realities of getting beyond 20th century technology. We at the FCC have done all in our power on this topic, including convening a year long task force to report on the challenges being faced. That report is now complete and has been submitted to this committee. We look forward to working with you on this important priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now we go to uh, Ms. Clyburn for uh, your opening statements. Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, distinguished members of the subcommittee, please allow me to begin uh, by offering my thoughts and prayers to the families and victims of this morning's attacks in Brussels. I am grateful for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Competition, competition, competition. It is a phrase we've heard Chairman Wheeler repeat time and time again, but today I wish to preview an axiom of my own. Community, community, community. In communities across this nation, be they urban or suburban, rural or tribal, there is a communications divide. A divide when it comes to broadband access, affordability and infrastructure, and a divide when it comes to the speeds necessary to take advantage of all the internet has to offer. This lack of connectivity has disadvantaged so many of our communities that Congress and the Commission widely decided to act by taking a few simple steps to help bridge these chronic divides. First, allow me to applaud the leadership of this committee as you consider common sense proposals to streamline and lower costs associated with the deployment of broadband. I stand ready to work with you in support of bipartisan proposals that will speed the deployment of broadband to more Americans. Second, I am pleased to have worked collaboratively with my colleagues Chairman Wheeler and Commissioner O'Reilly to create a blueprint for rate of return carriers so that rural communities are not left behind. Third, and this is critical, once connected, broadband service must be affordable. The Commission has a statutory duty to ensure that services are affordable and that low-income consumers have access to advanced services comparable to those available in urban areas. But for far too long, the Commission has fallen short of this directive. We have the capacity, however, to change this. The Chairman has circulated an order that, if adopted, will put Lifeline on the soundest footing of all of our universal service programs. The proposal seeks to achieve this by declining support to providers unless a neutral third party has determined that a household is eligible, eliminating duplicates, and requiring minimum standards. Now, my office has been inundated with concerns about the call for minimum standards, particularly for mobile voice, but the strongest part of the FCC's process, one that is the envy of regulators from across the globe, is that our process enables parties to give and receive feedback. If parties believe that the current proposal does not strike the right balance, I have been clear from the beginning that I am open to taking and making appropriate adjustments, and I plan to live up to that promise. I am committed to providing qualified lifeline consumers with choice and competitive 21st century options. And I am committed to addressing those outstanding concerns that reflect the input of our state regulatory partners, as well as those forward-looking providers who are engaged and committed to real reform. Finally, I am excited about the possibilities of 5G and its ability to fundamentally transform the way we live and interact with each other. I believe that the best way to deploy spectrum and infrastructure required to deploy those 5G services is for the industry to talk with local governments and communities, for them to find out what the specific needs of the communities are, and coordinate with them on how a 5G future can actually help those communities address their short and long-term needs. Working together on these and other initiatives will bring communities closer together, ensuring that they are better connected and ready for the challenges facing them. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you this morning, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have.
Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate uh, your service on the Commission and your, your comments this morning. We now go to Commissioner Rosa Wurzel. Good morning. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. And please go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. And let me add my uh, best wishes to the chorus for Ray Baum. Last week, I had the privilege of speaking in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. It's a festival for the connected, a place to get a glimpse of the future. From virtual reality to robotics, it's all there on the streets of Austin. Last week, I also spent time in California in a rural farming community in the Coachella Valley. It's a place where most roads lead to fields, but where broadband has not made its way to most households. Now, I can say with confidence I'm probably the only person who was in both of those communities last week. But as dissimilar as they seem, they have something in common. They both know that the future lies in connectivity. They both know that access to modern communications is no longer a luxury. It is where we create. It is where we innovate. It is a necessity for full participation in civic and commercial life. Now, expanding this access is front and center at the FCC. We are shortly beginning work on the world's first spectrum incentive auction. We will have work to do to repack our nation's broadcasters. We are updating our universal service policies, and we are exploring spectrum frontiers for 5G wireless service. But I want to focus on two things we can do right now that will make a difference for the least connected and most connected among us. We can make more space for Wi-Fi, and we can help bridge the homework gap. First up, Wi-Fi. The 2.4 gigahertz band where Wi-Fi makes its primary home is getting mighty crowded. The demand for 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi is also growing. So before we overwhelm Wi-Fi as we know it, we need more efforts to secure more unlicensed spectrum. There's no shortage of reasons why this is a good idea. Wi-Fi democratizes internet access. It helps wireless carriers manage their networks through the offloading of traffic. And it encourages permissionless innovation, just like what I saw all last week on the streets of Austin. And it is responsible for more than $140 billion in economic activity every year. But historically, the legislative process has overlooked the value of unlicensed spectrum because it gets low marks in the scoring process at the Congressional Budget Office. Yet this accounting misses the mark. It's outdated because the broader benefits of unlicensed spectrum to the economy are so great. So in any effort to increase the licensed spectrum pipeline, we need to explore a cut for unlicensed. Call it the Wi-Fi dividend. And right now at the FCC, we have a golden opportunity for a Wi-Fi dividend in the upper portion of the 5 gigahertz band. We have a consensus framework for testing this band for unlicensed use while also protecting incumbent efforts to use it for vehicle safety. So we need to work now with our colleagues at the Department of Transportation and the Department of Commerce and get this testing underway. We also have unlicensed opportunities in the guard bands in the 600 megahertz band and millimeter wave spectrum at 64 to 71 gigahertz. We need to seize all of them. Second, I want to talk about another issue that matters for the future of connectivity, and that's the homework gap. Today, roughly 7 in 10 teachers assign homework that requires access to the Internet. But FCC data suggests that as many as 1 in 3 households in this country do not subscribe to broadband service. So think about those numbers and where they overlap. That's what I call the homework gap. So if you are a student in a household without broadband, just getting homework done is hard. Applying for a scholarship is challenging. And while some students may have access to a smartphone, let me submit to you that a phone is just not how you want to research and type a paper, apply for jobs, or further your education. That is why the homework gap is the cruelest part of our new digital divide. But it is within our power to bridge it, and more Wi-Fi can help. In fact, in Coachella Valley, where I was last week, they are using Wi-Fi on school buses and turning ride time into connected time for homework but more can be done. And modernizing the Lifeline program to support online access in households with school-aged children is critical. And I think the sooner we act, the sooner we bridge this gap 
and give more students a fair shot at 21st century success. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Commissioner Pai. Delighted to have you before the panel again this morning, so please go ahead. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, members of the committee, and the indefatigable Ray Baum. Thank you for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to testify. I'd like to focus this morning on two issues where this subcommittee has led and where, unfortunately, the FCC is falling behind, FCC process reform and broadband deployment. I first want to begin by thanking the subcommittee for its longstanding focus on FCC process reform, for I firmly believe that the agency is at its best when it operates in a bipartisan, collaborative, and transparent manner. Unfortunately, the agency has not lived up to that standard recently. First, the FCC continues to be run in a partisan fashion. Since December of 2013, there have been 20 separate party line votes at our monthly meetings. That's twice as many as under Chairman Martin, Copps, Jenikowski, and Clyburn combined. Second, collaboration has fallen by the wayside. During my first 18 months on the job, Chairman Jenikowski and Chairwoman Clyburn led us to consensus 89.5% of the time on FCC meeting items. Over the past two years, that number has dropped precipitously to 56.4%. Reflecting this shift, the Chairman's office frequently shares non-public information with the press and select outside parties while leaving commissioners in the dark. For example, two weeks ago, FCC leadership shared the Chairman's lifeline proposal with the New York Times and promoted it on a call with reporters before sharing it with my office. That's hardly an opening for good faith collaboration yet it epitomizes how business is now done at the agency. Third, the FCC continues to shun transparency. Just last week, the Chairman's Office denied a request from me and Commissioner O'Reilly to release the rate of return reform plan before we vote, even though Commissioner O'Reilly helped write it, and even though rural advocates have told us that it is, quote, absolutely essential to see the written words on the page to understand the actual effectiveness of the reforms. Or take the idea of being more transparent with our enforcement process. The FCC has had success in recent years proposing headline grab grabbing fines, but its follow through has been abysmal. Since 2011, the FCC has proposed over $374 million in fines, but it has collected only 7.8 million. That's a meager 2% recovery rate. Only with additional transparency can the public and this subcommittee hold the FCC accountable for this colossal failure. Now, none of this has to be this way. When I testified before this subcommittee a year ago, there was widespread agreement that the FCC's process was broken. The chairman himself acknowledged that legitimate issues had been raised, and he announced a process reform task force. I took this project seriously, and I suggested reforms. Among other things, I suggested that the chairman provide final versions of an order a set time before we vote. I propose that every commissioner respond when one of us proposes edits. And I suggested that every commissioner provide his or her input by a date certain. But after participating in dozens of meetings, the chairman's task force has accomplished nothing. Not a single reform has been made one year later. Indeed, the task force has proven to be a, a Potemkin village designed to persuade Congress that the agency is doing something on process reform, and hence that legislation and oversight aren't required. But at this point, the only way to ensure meaningful FCC process reform is through legislation and vigorous oversight. I want to turn next to the topic of broadband deployment, and I salute the subcommittee for its leadership in this area. For its part, there is more the FCC can and should be doing. On Spectrum, we need to open the 5 gigahertz band to unlicensed innovation, as Ranking Member Eshoo and I recently called for in a joint op-ed. We need to move forward with another 12,500 megahertz of millimeter wave spectrum. And we need to launch a rulemaking to study spectrum above 95 gigahertz. On the wireline infrastructure side, we must continue to reform our rules for pole attachments. Let's reduce the cost that utilities charge internet service providers for preparing the poles and conduit. These make ready costs, as they are known, are a major barrier to competitive entry and the subcommittee rightly targeted them as ripe for reform. Let's exclude a poll owner's capital costs when establishing poll attachment rates. This would reduce broadband uh, prices and spur deployment. And let's start adjudicating poll attachment disputes with dispatch. 
Although the Commission has a special enforcement docket for these cases, complaints tend to languish. We have three from 2014 and two from 2015 still pending. We need to be adjudicating those in weeks, not years. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, members of the subcommittee, thank you once again for holding this hearing. Look forward to answering your questions and working with you to ensure a better future for all Americans and particularly the Kansas Jayhawks. Thank you. <laughs> wow. That last point kind of got slipped in there. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, Chairman Wheeler, uh, I didn't see Ohio State in the NCAA tournament, <laughs> but my ducks are certainly there. Um, okay, now we'll move right along to uh, Commissioner Can, I, can I duck that question? Yes, you <laughs> Yeah, we had a long way to get even between, uh, anyway, uh, back to football. Okay, now we go to Commissioner O'Reilly. Good morning, and uh, set us back on course. <laughs> I don't think your mic's on there. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and the members of the subcommittee for the honor of appearing before you today. I add my comments about Ray, and he knows my thoughts about him as well. Uh, let me start with the issue of FCC process reform, as my colleague did. I find it necessary to re reiterate that my efforts are not about undermining the chairmanship. As I've previously stated, even if every one of my proposals were adopted, the chairman would still control the agenda and win every vote. Additionally, this is not a response to the process or outcome of net neutrality. These problems existed prior to that particular item and remain today. Instead, my efforts attempt to empower the public to engage with the Commission through a fair process, rather than one deeply slanted to ensure that only the right insiders get information and can influence outcomes. At the same time, we must ensure that the rights of commissioners are not overrun by the chairman and the entrenched bureaucracy. Take, for example, our rules prohibiting all employees, including commissioners, from releasing non-public information about our proceedings. It sounds noble until you realize that the current practice prevents testing out ideas and exchanging creative ways to consider an issue. Moreover, the rule is being applied in a discriminatory manner to ensure that the chairman and certain staff can push selected information to favored parties while the commissioners remain muzzled. As for the chairman's process review task force, it is important for the subcommittee to realize what is actually occurring. The chairman came before this body three times last year and essentially said that my ideas were legitimate and he was going to consider each one through a special task force. The reality is, one year later, that task force has shown its real purpose, to diffuse the debate and deflect legislation in Congress. Just Friday, ironically, the last day of so-called Sunshine Week, the message was delivered that the general counsel, chairman, and other majority commissioners have objected to almost each and every idea I raised. My proposals to beef up written rationales for statutory authority, provide a check for instances when delegated authority is being taken too far, represent the opposing viewpoints when allowing outside witnesses at open meetings, or give the public more information about proposals being considered were all denied. They were even unwilling to agree to such basic courtesies as holding off on the press rollout until an item has actually been circulated to commissioners. In sum, all the chairman's leadership team can agree to do is minutia, such as setting expectations for timelines to post proposed edits on our internal email chains. This demonstrates that there is no intention of making any real changes absent congressional directives that would improve the ability of Americans to participate in their government. To the extent the subcommittee needs additional areas to review, I would observe that the Office of General Counsel has turned from an office focused on providing neutral legal analysis and defending commission items before the courts into what it believes is effectiv effectively a sixth commissioner with the ability to supersede the views of duly appointed and sworn commissioners. This is harmful to the FCC as an institution and will ensure that impartiality and rule of law are forever limited to the realm of secondary considerations. Turning to substance, I applaud the subcommittee for its extensive efforts to increase the amount of commercial spectrum and remove barriers to the deployment of wireless facilities. Part of my attention is focused on opening up millimeter waves for the next generation networks. Accordingly, all potential bands should be considered and simple and proven licensing frameworks should be adopted to ensure maximum investment in innovation. The commission also appears on track to meet its commitment to provide further relief for small cell siting, but more can be done to increase infrastructure deployment, namely concluding the decades old twilight tower review and addressing localities that continue to hinder facility siting. 
In the same vein, we must increase our efforts to open up the 5.9 gigahertz band for unlicensed use. Combining these frequencies with adjacent 5 gigahertz spectrum would permit increased throughput, speed, and capacity. It is not my intention to prevent or undermine dedicated short-range communications deployment, as sharing can occur without causing harmful interference to safety of life applications. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Reilly, thank you. And uh, we appreciate all the testimony of all the members and the chairman. Um, Commissioner Pai, I have several questions about the privacy NPRM you're considering. Press reports indicate the, uh, that the uh, predicate is an assumption that ISPs have unique access to user data, thus requiring regulation. Is this true? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, under the FCC's current rules, I'm prohibited from disclosing, even to you, the chairman of the subcommittee, the particular details of the proposal, uh, unless the chairman expressly authorizes it. Seriously? You that can't disclose even to us? Under the current FCC rules, that is correct. Chairman Wheeler, can you uh, address this? I'm confused as to why your fellow commissioners are not allowed to answer questions as to what's in the privacy proposal you've circulated, but I understand you and your, your media team and others <coughs> are free to speak about in public. This to me is an issue I think we, I, I know it's running that way, perhaps it's run that way in the past, but it seems peculiar that the other commissioners can't comment, but you can. Will you let them comment? Can you address this whole? So I don't think that I heard Commissioner Pai answer the question you asked him, which was, is there a difference between the data that an ISP sees and what an edge provider sees? So, so what the I said is I had several questions. Ans answering that question has nothing to do with what any specific paragraph of a proposal might say. All right. Point one. Point, point, if I may, point two. Um, it, uh, it, there is a full-throated already discussion about these kinds of concepts right, which, but, but which don't translate into the specific language. And three, if I, with respect, sir, three, the notice of proposed rulemaking is very specific, and, and the reason you have a notice of proposed rulemaking is so specific language can be put out so that it can be commented on by the public and have a full-voiced debate, well, which we will have on the specific language of this item starting next week. I, I think it, it, it's intriguing to me and disheartening to me that the commission is set up in a way that the chairman can propose something, the chairman can talk about something, and I'm not picking on you personally here, but just the way the system works. It's like if I proposed a bill circulated among all of us, and then my friend Mr. Doyle is prohibited from communicating on it publicly, or Mr. Pallone, I think you would have a different view of our process. Um, is uh, Commissioner Pai, is that not a, a corollary, that, that in effect that's what happens? The chairman of the FCC, take Mr. Wheeler out of it, any chairman can propose something. That chairman or chairwoman can comment on it at infinitum, New York Times, anybody, but you as a commissioner can't? That's exactly even to right. Us? That's exactly right, Mr. Chairman. It's a bizarre state of affairs where we have to pass something before the American public is allowed to see it, with a narrow and particularly notable exception of the chairman and his staff being able to push out misleading fact sheets, do press calls, and otherwise push their agenda before this full throated discussion has a chance to germinate. Uh, commissioner O'Reilly, do you encounter the same? Yes, Problem. sir. I, uh, I've written about this, and I, I believe the chairman has an opportunity to uh, write uh, a simple letter to authorize all commissioners to speak for the end of his, you know, as as needed uh, on any item uh, through the end of his tenure. He has declined to do that so far. Have other chairs done that? Uh, they have uh, provided more specific on particular items, but uh, what I'm suggesting is that the current process is just simply broken. I'm not sure that other commissioners or other chairmen have provided such uh, descriptions as my colleague just provided, where you're getting the blog, you're getting the press rollout, you're getting the fact sheets that are not accurate. And you are prohibited from commenting. I'm actually prohibited from correcting uh, the fact sheets when people come and meet with me. I can't say, you know, I know you think it's going this way, but actually it's th that's not true. I'm not allowed to tell them, gee, you're completely wrong. I've read the item. That's not right. This just flies in the face of open, transparent government, in my opinion, and needs to change. And, and Chairman, I would hope you would take 
Commissioner O'Reilly's comments to heart. Um, I don't know if we have to pass something here or put an appropriation bill or what, but this just, this is 2016. This is not 1816. We want an open and transparent process so the public can comment. We do it or we try to the best of our ability here by putting bills out for discussion. We have rules, they're made available, everybody has a chance. Um, I, I think it just needs to, to change. Um, I want to ask one other question in the seven seconds I have left, and it is to you, Mr. Wheeler. Um, the quadrennial review um, of broadcast ownership rules due by June 30. I know you all have had a lot on your plate. I've commended you for the work on the auction and all. But this one is a, a thorn under the, a uh, burr under the saddle. Um, eight years late. I, what's it going to take to get I a quadrennial review? On the floor and the schedule that I gave you, sir, and uh, it's. You'll get it done? On it for months. So it's going to be done this time by We're June 30? I'm going to put it on the floor. All right. My time has expired. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, uh, ranking uh, member on the subcommittee, Ms. Eshoo, for uh, questions for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Wheeler, we've got, um, you have, and the full commission has some huge issues before it. So uh, I want to go through three of them. Copyright, um, this all has to do with the uh, set-top box proposal. Uh, the issue of copyright, the issue of privacy, and the issue of, um, of uh, 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 impact on, uh, on uh, minorities, both from the professional side and from the consumer side. Uh, first on copyright. Copyright is important to all of us. Uh, we know... Um, that it is uh, uh, both the lifeblood and uh, of, uh, of uh, more than one industry, and uh, they depend on it being um, uh, protected. Uh, now, there are critics in all of this, and that's not a surprise. Um, when, a, um, you know, when a major shift is, um, is proposed and, um, and disruptive, it's disruptive to a $20 billion a year income to the cable industry. So, of course, people are going to fight very hard because it's, uh, there's a lot of money on the table. But uh, uh, on the issue of copyright, does anything about this arrangement and uh, uh, the FCC's proposal change under your proposed rules relative to copyright? Thank you, Ms. Eshoo. The answer is no. And let me just excerpt paragraph 71 of the proposal. We s to achieve the statutory mandate, our regulations must ensure that navigation devices, one, have content protection that protects content from theft, piracy, and hacking. Two, cannot technically disrupt, impede, or impair the delivery of services. Goes on beyond that. But the fact of the matter is that we have specified copyright protection is essential and can be maintained. And I would submit that there are tens of millions of examples of that called iPhones, iPads, mm -hmm. smart TVs, where copyright protection has been maintained through set-top box-like activity. Now, does the FCC give away any new or unpaid rights to uh, distribute uh, video programming? No, ma'am. Okay, the answer is no. Now, uh, in your first answer, is there... Uh, are there additions to the protection of copyright, or is it the same set of uh, principles and rules that apply today? Well, the interesting thing is that we actually took the language from the current cable card license, which has been very successful in protecting copyright. Okay. Now, on to um, the whole issue of um, minority-focused uh, uh, programming. Uh, critics uh, allege that the FCC's proposed rule, and you know this, would actually limit the availability of uh, minority programming and content. Um, now, uh, uh, Robert um, uh, L. Johnson and all members have a copy of the letter uh, that I received uh, last night. I think it's an important letter to read, and I'd like to ask for unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, uh, for Mr. Johnson's uh, letter to be placed Without on objection. the record. Thank you very much. Um, now, 
why is this issue even being raised? Um, there is a woeful record under what we are operating under now, because the cable companies have really moved at a glacial pace in their efforts to make more uh, minority programming available to consumers. Essentially, there are two or three large cable companies effectively uh, determining today what the American public sees and how they see it. So I, I don't know why there is a defense of this abysmal record when we have an opportunity to open uh, new doors uh, to diverse programming. Um, do you want to respond to this? Well, thank you, Ms. Eshoo. I mean, or would you respond you know, to there this? Are, there, are, uh, there are four African-American-owned channels in the 500-channel universe on a, on a cable system. Four out of how many? In the 500 channel universe, yeah. there are there, uh, and they and most of them are on the most expensive tier. By the way, mm -hmm. um, the but the interesting thing here is that there are literally hundreds of programmers who are seeking to get on and who are having the door right. slammed in their face. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you provide a way? How do you create equal opportunity so that these programmers can have an equality of standing? with the few handful that are there and have competition and opportunity. Gentlelady, time has expired. Yeah, my time has expired. Thank you, well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We'll now go to the Vice Chair of the Fold Committee, the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to first raise an issue involving a consortium of schools in Tennessee. USAC has denied millions of dollars in E-rate funding to the Sweetwater Consortium in many rural schools could be detrimentally impacted and the school districts stand to be financially crippled by the denial and of course the education opportunities limited and suffer significantly with such a decision. The Sweetwater Consortium just received a final decision from USAC on Friday denying their appeal and my office is continuing with other offices to gather information from the interested parties and we expect that this is going to end up with you all mm -hmm. before very long and Mr. Chairman the Tennessee delegation wrote the FCC last year and received a response on July 21st 2015 we appreciate that I understand that USAC needs to be a thorough watchdog of the taxpayer dollars and that the Commission is not yet in a position to offer an opinion on the merits of USAC's review, and you have noted that in your response to us. However, I'm concerned about the amount of time that the process has taken, and I know Chairman Wheeler, you also expressed that concern in our reply, and I will just say that we look forward to working with you uh, to find a resolution uh, to this. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, I want to thank you for your letter and or it was your uh, statement of dissent on the uh, choices in the Ovid issue. And I agree with you that it is regulation by speculation. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you just said, you know, that hundreds are seeking a way to get on, talking about uh, some of the independent producers and the content producers that are seeking an avenue for the content they, they produce. And I have to tell you, you don't create equal opportunity by not paying people for what they have created. And uh, Chairman Pai, coming to you, I will have to tell you, a lot of my content producers that are there in Tennessee, uh, they are very concerned about the set-top box proposal and about honoring copyright. Uh, the text of the proposal is something that has caused them tremendous concern, and they talk about it, and they bring it up to me. The chairman had said, oh, we're going to honor those copyright laws, but then they're reading this and they're saying, I don't see how this matches up. And because it would mandate that pay TV providers transmit to third parties all the programming, the pay TV providers license, allowing third parties to use that without obtaining the permission of the copyright holders or 
of compensating them. And, you know, the one of the concerns is the way the proposal explicitly declines to prohibit third parties from replacing or altering advertising or manipulating the content. So I would like for you to respond to me. Doesn't the proposal exceed the FCC's authority and create conflicts between commission regulations and copyright and contract law? Uh, Congresswoman, I believe it does, and your constituents are not alone. One of the most notable features of this proceedings that we heard from a variety of minority programmers, networks like Ovation, individuals like Avon Longoria, minority advocates like MMTC, as well as members of this uh, body, 30 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, for instance, who told us to a person that this would compromise the legitimate intellectual property rights that content creators, and minority content creators in particular, had in their creations. I thank you for that. I, I would hope that the commission will look very closely at what some of these innovators mm -hmm. and uh, content creators are pushing forward to the marketplace and protecting their copyright laws. To do this where you're looking at the set top, set top box proposal that is out there, I think is a dangerous step. It diminishes the value of content it diminishes the ability of those that have created this to be appropriately paid. It undercuts and undermines contract law. And for people who are innovating in this space, as we have more delivery avenues that are open, opening up to us, I think that the uh, proposal that is out there is a dangerous proposal when it comes to the validity and the value of contracts. And I yield back. Gentlelady's time's expired. We'll now go to the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to start with Commissioner Rosenworcel. I wanted to publicly thank you for coming up to my district right before that last major snowstorm to discuss the Sandy Act and how to improve communications during disasters. One idea we had coming out of these discussions is whether we could take a city in the area impacted by Sandy where we could work with industry and government officials to develop best practices that could be used across the country. So I just wanted to ask, do you think that that you know, would be a worthwhile experiment? Thank you, Congressman Pallone. So I have been in your district just after Hurricane Sandy, and now I can say I've been there just before Snowstorm Jonas. So I know that Mother Nature's wrath visits the New Jersey coastline <laughs> with some frequency. And I think developing a smart city that's a resilient city on the coast is a terrific idea. And my hope is that by preparing for the worst, we can take those best practices from New Jersey and export them all around the country. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Commissioner O'Reilly about pirate radio. I wanted to personally thank you for leadership in addressing the spike in pirate radio stations. And the last time you were here, we talked about how this is an important issue. Uh, and I, I was. I was hoping to be able to introduce a bill that would put a stop to these illegal sig uh, signals. Could you, um, I know you have a long background in, in crafting legislation. Do you have any suggestions for what to include in a bill like that? So one of the issues that I've been working on and, and the commission has been gracious and the chairman has been gracious in helping me facilitate is getting to some of the money side of the equation. How do we uh, dry up money for pirate radio broadcasters? Uh, and I think that's something where we can focus in legislation that, and we're working with your good staff and trying to target how to get at the money part from, and we have a number of people that are advertising, we have political uh, ca campaigns that are advertising on pirate radio stations, we have concert uh, pro venues that are, ca that are advertising, we need to figure out how best to go after the money side. And, but I want to be careful on that and I want to make sure that it's narrowly targeted so we don't go after uh, those that are, that are uh, trying to do a, a good job that are uh, un, uh, unfortunately captured in that universe, such as uh, building owners and, and renters. We want to want to go after those that are facilitating, not those that, that may, have, may, may have provided some of these. Uh, thank you. Well, we'll work together. I'd like that. Um, Chairman Wheeler, I, I released earlier this year a discussion draft bill called the Viewer Protection Act, which we've discussed, that would make sure consumers keep access to the channels that stay on the air after the incentive auction. And while I hope this bill will be bipartisan, I've heard from some of my colleagues that they want to wait until we know how many broadcasters will need to be repacked. At the same time, it's critical that the bill is introduced with enough time to go through regular order so it's ready when the repacking process begins. 
so I think it would be helpful for us all to better understand the schedule for the auction going forward. Could you walk us through your estimate of how the next few months would play out, uh, paying particular attention to when we would know how many broadcasters will need to be repacked? Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Um, as I said in my statement, the reverse auction bidding um, will start in May. Uh, exactly when in May, we don't know yet. It depends upon what we find out when we're sorting through all this data to come up with, uh, 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 with, a, with a channel plan. Um, how long it lasts after that <laughs> is, a, is a function of the marketplace. Um, <coughs> if, if I were a betting man, and, and it, I have no insight into this because it has, <laughs> it's totally in control of the market, not in control of the commission, but I think we're looking at, if we start uh, in May, sometime you know, late summer, early football season, uh, that we have uh, a, a, a resolution. But again, that's something that's totally out of my control, uh, our control, and that the, uh, the market will determine. All right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate your input on all these questions. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, former chairman of the committee, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome the commission to the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, so far, nobody's asked you one question about your budget, which is theoretically why we're here, and I'm going to continue that tradition of not asking you any questions about <laughs> your budget. <laughs> um, my, my question, though, is, is extremely serious, actually. This morning, we had three explosions rock Brussels Airport and Metro Station. We think at least 26 people have been killed. There are over 100 that have been injured. The last time the commission was before this subcommittee uh, was just after the Paris attack. And I asked uh, Mr. Wheeler then what the committee could do in conjunction with the FCC to try to counter these terrorist attacks and the way that they use the Internet to broadcast their terrorism. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, you, Chairman, you mentioned that maybe the Congress needed to update the definition of what a lawful intercept is under CALEA. Um, have y'all looked at that since you were before the committee? If so, do you have any recommendations for the committee? Um, and I want to be clear, I'm not trying to ask the FCC to shut down the Internet, um, but I do think that in an open society you can strike a balance between, between uh, openness and uh, protecting the... Uh, the public good. So uh, I'm going to ask the question to the chairman, but if the other commissioners want to chime in, you're very welcome to. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Um, and yes, this is a tragic time and a terribly serious issue. The Congress has said to the FCC that our responsibility, and I use that word not just our authority, <laughs> our responsibility, is to make sure that in the networks that we regulate, there is the equipment to carry out lawful intercepts. That is the definition that Congress has given us the scope and the scope of our authority. The question of what is a lawful intercept is something that is beyond the statutory authority that you have given us. Um, the discussion that we had last time was to the effect that it is up to Congress to make the determination as to what is the scope of a lawful intercept. But I will assure you, sir, that we will fully take the steps necessary to make sure that the equipment that is required to have to, to be able to make that lawful intercept uh, is in place. Okay. Any of the other commissioners want to comment? Okay. 
um, on something a little bit more mundane. Um, this issue of the set top boxes, which the chairman alluded to and Congresswoman Blackburn alluded to. There's, I'm co-chair with the Privacy Caucus here in the House. And there's a real concern uh, that it, you're going to make it possible, perhaps inadvertently, to allow uh, the collection of large amounts of, of data, perhaps even megadata, um, without the consent or knowledge of the um, of the customer, of the client. Um, Commission, Mr. Chairman, you were not real forthcoming to, to our subcommittee chairman, Mr. Walden. Um, can you at least acknowledge that we it is an issue and that you, we've got to be very cognizant to try to whatever the commission does uh, protect the legitimate privacy rights of the individual? Without a doubt. Congressman, and let me see if I can be specific on this, because if you say I wasn't specific enough. Mm -hmm. Section 631 of the Act uh, establishes privacy expectations on cable operators and satellite providers. Um, and, um, and what our, uh, well, and, and they, they then have the, that relationship with Roku and TiVo and folks that they're now working with that say you will, that say in their contracts with them, you will maintain the same kind of privacy protections that, that we do. And what we're saying is that any competitive box, set-top box or app, has to be able to make the same kind of assurances and that if those assurances are not made, that the cable operator then doesn't have to do business with that box, and that just like set top, uh, just like smart TVs and tablets and smartphones, all have that same kind of ability to, to collect information and have the FTC oversight, that if the protections that we have put in place are not, still not sufficient, that the FTC has authority to do something. Aaron, as recently as last week, the FTC put out a notice to smart TV manufacturers that they intend to do. Okay. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barton. We'll now turn to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Wheeler, I want to thank you for your leadership on special access and for advancing this issue through a very thorny process. Uh, it's critical that we get this right, and it's critical that we get this done. I believe your team is working diligently on this proceeding. I would only ask that as you work through this issue, you be sensitive to the harm that's being done at this moment to competition across the country, and that as you proceed, you keep in mind that this is an ongoing issue that's not only hurting competitors, but hurting consumers as well. With regards to Lifeline, as you move forward with Lifeline reform, I would ask you to be mindful uh, and ensure that low-income Americans can still use this program with no additional cost. Opening up the program to more competition and enabling participants to choose how they use their subsidy is great. But I would ask you to take particular care to ensure that free options remain available and that enough flexibility exists in the program so that people don't lose their access to this critical resource. Uh, with regards to privacy, thank you again for moving forward on this issue. I was happy to see the Commission take action in the order to prohibit super cookies, as well as the enforcement action it took on the same issue. However, I must say I was disappointed to not see a prohibition on deep packet inspection or a proposal to prohibit companies from manipulating consumers into giving up their privacy for a discount on their bills. Privacy shouldn't be a luxury for a few that can afford it. So as you move forward with this proceeding, I'd ask the Commission ensure that it is not enabling ISPs to charge consumers for their own privacy. And finally, on zero rating, I remain concerned about zero rating in the marketplace. 
Studies have shown that consumers by far prefer zero-rated apps and services when faced with the expense of busting their data caps. This gives ISPs a natural advantage in the marketplace and enables them to choose winners and losers. I don't think that we need a blanket ban on zero rating, but when ISPs zero rate their own apps and when zero rating programs are anti-competitive, consumers are being harmed. So I would ask you, Chairman Wheeler, to uh, encourage you to take action to police these programs. Now, I went through all those quickly uh, to give you some time. Um, you and Commissioner Pai, you know, Commissioner Pai said a, quite a few things today that I think might have hurt your feelings. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe comment uh, uh, on, on your stewardship of, of the commission. And, uh, and also, there seems to be a, a disagreement here on whether or not on the issue of set-top boxes uh, that, that uh, copyright uh, is being protected uh, and that whether it's true that people can take other people's content and not pay for it. So in the remaining uh, two minutes and 26 <laughs> seconds, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have been all those. The, the floor is yours. Let me go, let me see if I can kind of tick through a couple of them. Number one, um, on, on the copyright issue. You know, the interesting thing is that, um, that there are today um, competitive, the equivalent of competitive set-top boxes uh, available in the market. For instance, Google Chrome. Now, a lot of things that we hear about, oh, this is Google's big plan to take over cable TV, malarkey. Um, the, the Google Chrome, which, you know, attaches in your, in your, uh, uh, in your port, in your, in your TV to allow you to get things off of the web, does not violate copyright, does not overlay commercials, <laughs> does not do all of the horrible things that everybody said a set-top box like that would do. So, so, and, and, and because copyright law is sacrosanct. The second thing is, I think the people would go crazy and revolt if something like that happened. So that's on the copyright issue. Secondly, on the, on the process issue. There is a, an interesting dichotomy of criticism that we have heard this morning. One is that, um, that we have been operating in a, a unilateral fashion and not being collegial. Um, and the other is that the collegial efforts that we have had to address process that haven't resulted in a consensus being built are somehow witness of a nefarious intent. Uh, I find those two to be in conflict. Um, and uh, to the other issues you, you list, you're absolutely right. Lifeline, we have to make sure that Lifeline um, uh, is, is, is updated and that it is available. And, and the fascinating thing, if I got time, let me, the, the key thing here is that digital is cheaper than analog voice. You notice that every single consumer who signs up to LTE service, which is, you know, 80-some percent of Americans, can get free, unlimited voice. But if you're a poor person, we're limiting what you can do we're saying you can't get on the internet, you can't have access, we're gonna stick you in this analog world. And that's one of the things that we're gonna take on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad your feelings weren't hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair, uh, the gentleman, time has expired. I uh, now recognize Mr. Lotta from Ohio. <coughs> Thank you very much. And to the Commission, thanks very much for being here today. And oddly enough, uh, Commissioner Pai, I'm going to be talking to you and asking some questions about set-top boxes and the integration ban. Seems like uh, something that's been uh, discussed quite a bit this morning. As you know, that uh, Congressman Green and I were able to secure language in Stellar to eliminate the integration ban in order to rid the marketplace of an outdated technology and to foster greater competition and innovation. The FCC is now contemplating mandates that would leave multi-channel video programming distributors no choice but to provide a box on top of the third-party device. This would once again bring us back to the problems of the integration ban of higher costs to consumers for devices and higher energy costs for them as well. And 
in this committee room we were having the uh, Secretary of Energy before us. He even, he even said that about higher energy costs. You've stated that the FCC should be seeking a boxless solution, which I believe is the future of pay TV. Does the apps-based proposal that was put forth through the Downloadable Security Tech, uh, Technical Advisory Committee, the DSTAC, get consumers to a boxless world? And let me ask you also, as you uh, answer that question, what we're looking at with the FCC's uh, proposing, are we going forward? backwards, staying static, and I think what the consumers out there want to know is where we're going to be in 10 years, not where we were 10 years ago. Commissioner? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I think the best way, if I could tackle the second question first, uh, to encapsulate what the FCC's approach has been, is back to the future. Instead of moving to an app-based uh, app world where consumers can finally free themselves of this expensive, clunky equipment that consumes a lot of energy and doesn't provide the functionality they want, uh, the FCC is doubling down on 1990s technology, and it's essentially going to force MVPDs, cable operators, and the like, uh, to do one of two things. E number one, either re-engineer their entire network, or number two, uh, supply your consumers with a second box. Now, I submit to you that the natural effect is going to be the second, because re-engineering a network is extremely expensive compared to simply supplying a second box. That's not what consumers want to do. And so I would have hoped that the agency, going to the first question, would have teed up in a full and fair manner the other proposal that the Downloadable, Downloadable Security Technology Advisory Committee proposed. One, to be clear, was the majority's approach, which was uh, to have this 1990s technology uh, embraced yet again. But the other one was an app-based approach. And instead, there's a very slanted three-paragraph discussion in this huge document asking why the app-based approach would end to the destruction of America and uh, you know, all, all things bad. And I think if we had embraced this in a <laughs> full and fair manner, allowed the American people to comment, we wouldn't be in the pickle we're in where the former chairman of this committee, Mr. Waxman, just yesterday said that this approach is a 20th century solution to a problem the market is already solving on its own. Okay, why, why is that? Why did the, why did the FCC do that? Well, I think uh, frequently the natural inclination of the agency of late has been to solve problems that don't exist. But secondly, I think that there is an, um, there's a recognition among some people that this marketplace hasn't developed as expected. And I completely agree with them. The reason is that this entire marketplace is the creation of a 20-year regulatory framework that's highly intrusive. And I would humbly submit that technical mandates and agency micromanagement is not the way to get us uh, to the next stage of the digital video revolution. Instead, we should embrace a more consumer-friendly approach, an apps-based approach, for example, and let the marketplace develop you know, free from some of these legacy regulations that have simply held us back. The set-top box is not the way of the future. My kids are not going to know what a set-top box or some of this other equipment is. What they will be familiar with is being able to access the content they want on the device they want using an app or other device that, that they want. That is the future, not the 1990s. Let me follow up, uh, Commissioner. Over the past several Congresses, I've introduced a bill that required the FCC to conduct a cost-benefit analysis at the time of the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, and again at the time of the final rule is issued. I think it's important for the public and the Commission to have a better understanding of monetary impact of the FCC rules. In respect to the proposed set-top box rules, I believe it would be of great value to identify the costs and benefits this rule would have on consumers and MVPDs, especially on small and medium-sized providers. Did the Commission complete a cost-benefit analysis of this rule? It did not. Why not? I think, frankly, because if you uh, objectively tallied up the possible costs and benefits, it would be fairly clear that the Commission's approach would have yielded, ultimately, uh, uh, disadvantages to the consumer at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much, and as my time expires, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. We now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Loebsack. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I was thinking that I was not going to go for a little bit yet. But uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I really appreciate this conversation we're having. I was going to ask about set-top box, but I think I'm going to forego that one this time. I think it's being covered pretty exhaustively. Um, I do want to say, uh, Commissioner Pye, uh, I'm all for the Jayhawks, too, because I'm an Iowa State alum, but uh, hopefully the Cyclones are going to do well as well. Um, I can sign on to that, Congressman. That's okay. That's all right. Um, I, I do 
speak to former Congressman Jim Ryan quite often about these issues, you <laughs> might imagine. But um, at any rate, and uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel, in particular, I know you're all concerned about rural broadband, but thank you so much for your tremendous efforts uh, on that front. Look forward to seeing you in Iowa at some point down the road as well when we can chat with some of our folks in Iowa who are particularly concerned about this, so thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is first uh, ask Chairman Wheeler uh, about the enhanced transparency issue uh, having to do with uh, uh, broadband development and small businesses. You had your particular uh, order that was out there, but then I worked with um, uh, Chairman Walden and other members recently to get a bipartisan bill passed where, you know, we mm -hmm. have a different approach to that in terms of how we define small business and uh, extend the period for the uh, for the exemption, if you will, for these small broadband providers. And there's really broad, broad bipartisan support to make sure that we provide the necessary regulatory relief to these folks so that they really can, in fact, expand that broadband capability to as many folks in these rural areas as possible. Um, and we're hopeful that the Senate will take this up and that the President would sign whatever legislation comes out of this. But um, if that's not the case, might it be true that the FCC would uh, does intend to further exempt small providers from the enhanced transparency rules. Thank you, Congressman. Um, as you know, we have exempted them, and we right. recently extended that um, exemption. Um, any decision, with, there's been a lot of talk about the transparency of process and everything here. Right. Uh, it's inappropriate for me to sit here and say, oh, yes, there will be an extension or whatever. We will go through the process. We will build the appropriate record and act accordingly. Right. And just but it's clear what we've done thus far. Yeah, right. And recognizing that there is that bipartisan support here, you know, to extend it uh, further, if you will. Did any others here want to comment on that particular issue? Yes, ma'am. On that particular issue, um, as the chairman uh, alluded to, we're going through a Paperwork Reduction Act process which will look at and examine the impact on those um, uh, on those particular carriers. Uh, I th believe it's 100,000 uh, lines and below. Um, I was pushed uh, uh, for them being uh, ex exempted while we uh, review that and see if the impact um, is uh, pr in proportion with their capacity. Thank you. Um, and also, Chairman Wheeler, on the incentive auction, uh, Mr. Chairman, regarding the upcoming incentive auction itself, I'm concerned about the impact that the FCC's repacking plan might have on broadcasters and viewers in rural America, as you might imagine. Uh, if the FCC implements a regional repacking plan, will broadcasters in areas like Iowa be repacked last because there is less of a spectrum crunch? And if so, can you assure me that broadcasters in rural markets We'll have as much time to transition as broadcasters in areas where there is a spectrum crunch. I'm concerned that there is a 30 month, 39 month deadline to transition and, and whether broadcasters in rural areas may not be able to start right away. Can you address that issue? Thank you, Congressman. <coughs> the, um, this is one of the reasons why we have now, as the chairman indicated, begun the pivot to, okay, what happens after the auction? Everybody is right. thinking about with the bidding, but okay, then you have to implement it. Uh, and we are putting together a team that will deal with that question. One of the proposals on the table right now is some kind of regional repacking plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not yet made a decision um, on that. There are all kinds of extenuating circumstances that exist right. in various parts of the country. Clearly, it doesn't make sense to have the limited assets of folks who erect <coughs> antennas racing hither and yon right. to be able to do things. Uh, we have to be able to manage that appropriately um, and to deal with the kinds of issues that you raise. I can't sit here and say, sir, I've got the written out answer, but I can say, sir, yes, sir, we're on top of that. No, thank you very much. Uh, again, as <coughs> you can see, the rural theme to my questions here, obviously. But I know that a lot of folks here uh, uh, on this panel and, and on the larger committee have these very same concerns that I have on a bipartisan basis. So that's why I've raised those issues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Thank the gentleman for yielding <coughs> back. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a, a good hearing. I think we've talked about a broad range of different issues that you all are, are dealing with. Um, I, I, wanted, I have two. One's already been asked, so uh, that'll save me a little bit of time. Uh, in the country right now, there, there is a, a revolt brewing in the country, and I attribute it to a couple things. One uh, thing I attribute it to is 
an understanding of uh, the legislative activities of passing of bills and then the bills being signed into law. Also understanding that the executive branch is defined by the Constitution to enforce those laws. So when we see duly passed statutes um, in law and then an agency disregard that, that's, that's kind of leading to this revolt and this frustration out there. And I, I can say, I mean, I just came through a primary. And so I was with the public 24 seven for two months and it is visceral and it is, it is real. So I'm, I'm to Commissioner Pai, I wanna ask this question first because this is, this is an a example. I think it spreads across the agencies, not just here. So we passed a bill signed in the law on joint service agreements. Uh, that then delayed that for 10 years. Wasn't ambiguous. Um, there weren't exceptions included. It just said all JSAs. Of course, I think you were surprised. I was shocked to see that last month that the chairman's office forcing parties to eliminate JSAs through merger review. How is this not example of this frustration out in, in America of an agency disregarding the clear statute of law and congressional intent? And could you comment on that? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I think unfortunately is a paradigmatic example of the agency's disrespect for the rule of law. It's pretty rare that this body, as you know all too well, reaches an overwhelming bipartisan agreement on anything. But it, in December of 2015, uh, with a unified voice, both houses of Congress and the president instructed the agency to grandfather existing j uh, joint sales agreements between certain broadcast TV stations. The agency simply thumbed its nose at that statutory command and ordered the unwinding of certain j joint sales agreements, including one joint sales agreement uh, by Entravision in my home state of Kansas, which provides the only Spanish language news in the state. That's remarkable for two reasons. Number one, it's obviously diverse programming that I and my fellow Kansans could benefit from. But secondly, it also contradicts an express commitment to the Congress uh, by FCC leadership last year that there is, quote, nothing in what we are doing that would make that, the Intervision JSA, go away. Uh, that was simply flouted. And I think it is telling that uh, a couple of weeks ago, a bipartisan group of 12 senators, uh, led by Senator Roy Blunt, Senator Dick Durbin, including Senators Tim C Scott, Charles Schumer and others told the agency that it was, quote, bypassing uh, congressional will and ignoring bipartisan concerns by forging ahead with this path. And so if the agency can't be constrained by law, then it's pretty much just the caprice of uh, one individual or a majority of commissioners at any given point in time. And that's not uh, how they think the agency should operate under any leadership, regardless Commis of political. Commissioner O'Reilly, you see your. I agree with my colleague on both the content and the, the point he is making and the one point you've made. And I take it to another example, and I know we've talked about set top boxes uh, in a number of different questions, but if you look at the statute, it, the commission is taking this beyond the equipment itself and taking it to applications. And it says, you know, the statute says converter boxes, interactive communications equipment, and other equipment. And yet we're taking it to applications. So first we take it to, we take equipment and interpret it to be sta software, and then software goes to applications. So applications that have nothing to do with the set-top boxes that they operate today will be covered by our rules. Yeah, and, I and I just want to end on this, because this kind of also talks about um, this aspect, I, I am very concerned uh, <coughs> about this, uh, the FCC process debate and the opening statements on that. Because maybe some of the things that have occurred, had there been an open process, you know what, I, I would call on the commissioners to, to enact civil disobedience and disregard the, the chairman's edict. And if the chairman can speak to people any place, any time on something coming down, I would challenge you. I did some research, no, no one's done that yet, but by guy, if there's ever a time to fight, to fight for transparency and the rule of law, it's now, it's in this environment, and I would encourage you to do that, and I'll yield back my time. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Now recognize the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Stewart. Thank you so much. Um, as a former, um, constitutional lawyer, I was really quite dismayed to hear Commissioner Pai's 
testimony about that the commissioners are prohibited from commenting on future rules. And Chairman Wheeler, I, w someone asked you that question. I didn't quite get the answer. So I, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I, I'd like you to help me clarify this. Under the current rules uh, of the FCC, commissioners are prohibited from releasing the language of pending rules until they're voted on in the proceedings. Is that right? Yes, ma'am, for the and final rule, but on an NPRM, yeah. one of the things we have done in during my administration so our, okay. is we put out the draft language. So so you put out draft language, is that correct? The, the, the notice of proposed rulemakings that we vote on always include in them a rebuttable presumption, here is what we are proposing in terms of specific language. Okay, so stop. So we can have the kind of stop. debate we've had today. Stop. Yes. Okay. Yes, now, so you do put out proposed language yes, in the notice of proposed rulemaking. Then you debate on it and you vote on it. Yes, and then the, then, the, then the rule is released, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, do you have a prohibition on commissioners talking about the proposed rules in advance of the vote? No. Yes or no will work? No. Because, and we have these discussions, speeches, blogs. I mean, I'm, as, a, as a person who spent 30 years practicing before the commission, I can assure you <laughs> that throughout history there has been an ongoing dialogue where commissioners have been speaking out, speaking publicly, talking to the various parties. So, so under your leadership, what you're saying is that, that when there's a proposed rulemaking, commissioners are allowed to exercise their First Amendment rights and speak about the, pr about the pending proceedings, correct? What I'm saying is that nothing has changed. But can you just answer my question? I'm sorry, would you? Yes. Are commissioners allowed to speak publicly about proposed rulemakings? They are allowed to speak about the substance of the rulemaking. Right, the, right. The rule that they keep citing goes to can they take the specific language right. and circulate it? See, that's what I'm trying to help you get out. Okay. So, so they can talk about the proposed rulemaking, yes, but they're not allowed to release the underlying language while it's still under consideration. Is that correct? Other than a notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking where it is. And is what is the rationale for doing that? Um, it, has, I, it has always been that way, ma'am. And, and what's the rationale? I believe the rationale is in order to facilitate deliberation amongst the commissioners. Great. Thank you. That's all I was trying to ask you. Now, um, Commissioner Clyburn, in your written testimony, you mentioned um, interest in how the broadband can play a role in health care outcomes. And as you might know, Chairman Upton and I and the whole rest of the Energy and Commerce Committee are working on 21st century cures. A lot of this bill relies on um, expansion of the ability to collect data and then to aggregate that data in cl clinical trials. And so I just, um, I just wanted to let you know that I think what you're talking about is really important, and I think we need to be working together to make sure that we can get these benefits all around the country because part of the whole process with, um, with this big data and healthcare research is to get a much bigger diversity both geographically and ethnically of people who are involved in clinical trials. So I'd like to be able to work with you going forward to making sure that we can achieve these ends. Absolutely. We have a Connect to Health Task Force, and we look forward to working with your office to, to, to realize the potential uh, that health and technology that marriage would bring. Thanks. So, you know, I've got a few seconds left. L let me just go back to what I was talking to Chairman Wheeler about, because what I was trying to get out of him is this. Is, is I can, uh, once it was explained to me, I can see a real reason why you'd want the proposed actual language of the proposed rules to be handled through the chairman's office. And, I'd, and you'd want to have, have people be able to talk internally about that, and you wouldn't want people just releasing bits and pieces of that language. But I also, so I, I agree with that, but I also think it's important that the commissioners 
can, can exercise their First Amendment rights without releasing that language. And, and I think that's what's happening now. So I, th I think we just need to, everybody take a deep breath and step back and try to have a little bit more comity on the whole commission. Thank you. I we yield back. I, I don't apologize. Have Thank the gentlewoman for yielding back. I now recognize oh, Mr. Lance from New Jersey. Uh, thank you. And I also practiced constitutional law in New Jersey. And so I would like to ask Commissioner Pye and Commissioner O'Reilly to comment on the colloquy between my colleague, Congresswoman DeGette, and the chairman. Thanks for the opportunity, Congressman. It is flatly not true that commissioners have full and fair latitude to discuss what is in a commission proposal or a commission order. Right now, I cannot hand you this document, which is the Commission's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on Privacy. I cannot quote to you anything in this document in the Commission's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. And if you were to do that, would uh, you be s subjected to some sort of uh, legal action? Absolutely. There are sanctions uh, that are unspecified in our rules, but I have no doubt that uh, I wouldn't be given the, the rule of lenity, the benefit of the rule of lenity when it comes to enforcing it. Commissioner O'Reilly, this to me is as clear as mud. Yeah, so uh, I agree to the point that you may be concerned about the specific language being shared, but even the ideas themselves, non-public information is the term used in the rule. So anything that's non-public, so if there's an idea in here. Presumably that, there, that is non-public. I do not know what is in that document of 15 or 20 or 30 pages, and there is no way I, in the... Uh, branch of government that's uh, mentioned in Article I of the Constitution. I am not privy to that. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Uh, Commissioner Pai? Well, not only that, the rationale for keeping all of this secret is completely baseless. I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't have deliberations while still having transparency. Now, first of all, we don't have internal deliberations now on any item of significance, so the suggestion is simply inaccurate. But even beyond that, there's no reason why, if you propose a bill, Congresswoman, and it goes on the website, there's no reason why you and Congressman Lance can't sit down and hammer out agreements and have deliberations in a full and fair way. An agency is no different. The American public deserves to know what we're going to do before we propose to do it, and I don't think that's too much to ask. And, and if you were to release only a portion of it, and if you were to mischaracterize a portion of it, undoubtedly uh, another member of the commission would say, no, uh, this is the full and fair uh, interpretation of the larger document. If, and this happens in the branch of government in which we are involved, and I would hope in the executive branch as well. So if for some reason you were to mischaracterize or not fully uh, disclose the entire intent of, of the document uh, uh, under uh, the marketplace of ideas. Wouldn't that be corrected by another member of the commission? Commissioner Pye, Commissioner O'Reilly, please. So Absolutely right. So I, I agree with your analysis, and it could be corrected by, but it, it actually happens today under the current structure because the fact sheets that are being put out are inaccurate, and I don't have the right under our rules to correct them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you characterize them as, as inaccurate, and that may be true, that may not be true. Um, I, I tend to think it's true, but regardless of whether it's true or not, what would be wrong with a full discussion? I would be fully comp uh, comfortable releasing the information so people can make a judgment whether my analysis is right or wrong. Commissioner Pai? Nothing would be better than to avoid all these he said, she said uh, disputes by releasing the document. That way there's no debate about context mm -hmm. and everybody can see for himself or herself. And, and, and whether or not this has what been the situation over the years uh, regarding the commission, uh, do, do you believe, gentlemen, that it would be better moving forward if this were to change, I place it in the subjunctive voice, if this were to change, and why do you think it should change? Whoever is leading the agency, Republican or Democrat, I would hope that they would embrace the same spirit of transparency that the Congress has in terms of making things public before they're voted upon. Commissioner uh, Rosen, Warsaw, your, your comments on the discussion I've had with your colleagues? Um, well, thank you. Uh, I have not found that our existing policies get in the way of me having substantive conversations with stakeholders of every stripe. I'm a little bit confused by the difficulties that my colleagues are having. I know that they too held regular meetings with public interest authorities, industry, 
and have general discussions about the matters before us. I'm sure that every one of us here uses those discussions to inform our deliberations and our decision making and voting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in your opinion, do you and I have a right to go back and forth in the document that Commissioner Pai has at his desk? I believe we have the right to go back and forth and discuss any matter that's before the agency. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know what's contained in that document. Are you able to release to me what's contained in that document? I don't believe we are. And why is that, Commissioner? I believe that's under the, our Commission's rules right now. Well, I understand what the rules are. I'm questioning the rules. I, I, I obviously understand what the rules are. Uh, the rules may say that this room is painted uh, pink. It's actually painted green. I understand what the rules are. Do you agree with the rules? I think that we can do more so that our discussions are transparent but I also think it's essential that we preserve the right to have deliberations among the five of us and actually review the text and discuss the text among all of us. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should strive to be more transparent, but I think we have to preserve some space for honest deliberation. I, I, I think it's essential to the American people that we in the first branch of government under Article I have the ability to review what's contained in that document. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. and. Uh, now the chair recognizes uh, the general lady from California, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I am not a constitutional lawyer, <laughs> so I cannot provide any more clarity to, to this, but I appreciate the discussion and uh, Commissioner Rosenwitzel's uh, response. Um, let me talk about something I am passionate about, and that's a lifeline. Access to broadband is absolutely essential for the participation in the 21st century economy. We all know this, that affordability has been a major obstacle for the Americans that live on the wrong side of the digital divide. We all know that broadband is not a luxury, but an absolute necessity. And as Commissioner Rosenworth always says, for parents helping kids with their homework and for businesses in all our communities and for every American to succeed, I'm thrilled that the FCC is finally modernizing the Lifeline program into the 21st century. It's been something I've been calling for since 2009 when I introduced, I believe, the first legislation to expand Lifeline to broadband. Now, as we do so, I hope the FCC makes sure that these changes are beneficial to the low-income consumers the program is designed to help, and I believe others have brought up this concern, and does not harm the vulnerable consumers in the Lifeline program today. What I've heard are concerns about the FCC's proposed changes to support for mobile voice service. And as we expand Lifeline to broadband, we can't forget that low-income consumers still need to be able to make voice calls, especially 911 in the event of an emergency. Chairman Wheeler, quickly, can you explain the proposed changes you are making to Lifeline support for mobile voice services? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. The goal is to create a glide path, a phase-in where over the next three and a half years, we're moving from an all analog um, uh, lifeline service to a digital lifeline service where we can take advantage of the fact that a digital voice minute costs less than an analog voice minute. And by the fact, by the sheer fact that we're now delivering things digitally, give those using their phone, in your example, mm -hmm. access to the internet as well. So let me give you a specific example. We are talking about two gigabits of data being the minimum threshold uh, in 2018 as we, as we phase in. Two gigabits of data for, uh, for the existing price would be giving the consumer access to 1,700 web pages and 900 minutes of voice talk. The, uh, the, there are 50 percent of the existing Lifeline users uh, use less than 100 minutes. Two-thirds use less than 200 minutes. So what we're talking about here is a quantum leap in the ability to have access to minutes and this incredible ability to access the internet. Okay. Um, Commissioner Clyburn, do you think that you've struck the right balance here? We are still uh, deliberating. Uh, we are listening to parties and uh, winding up our ex parte process. 
uh, when I started on this, it, it was a, a process that a lot of people did not want to take this right. particular journey. Um, we are on the cusp of uh, making a tremendous change for those 39 million households that are, are eligible. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing and working with you to make sure that this program is one that we can all be proud. Okay, thank you. Um, I often speak about the need for greater access to Spectrum to fuel our wireless economy. Spectrum is the invisible infrastructure that powers mobile networks. As we look ahead to 5G, networks will be transporting more data than ever before, but wireless services also rely on wires, which is one of the reasons I care about special access reform. Commissioner Rosenworcel, do you agree that we need a competitive special access market so that the United States can continue to lead the world in 5G? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I do, and I agree with your assessment that wi our wireless networks require wired infrastructure as well. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. Is that okay? Certainly, if I may, well, yes, I yield. Thank you. Uh, there's something that was said earlier uh, from the panel uh, about um, uh, in search of a uh, 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 of a problem that doesn't have a solution or we don't need one, et cetera, et cetera, relative to set-top boxes. And I just want to put this on the record. Since the Telecommunications Act opened everything up to competition, including set-top boxes, the price of everything else has gone down 90%. The increase of fees for set-top boxes has increased by 185%. And it's consumers that are picking up the tab. And it is essentially a monopoly. It's essentially a monopoly. In my district, you talk about boxes. They say, think outside the box. We don't have any boxes. I think it's about time that in the 21st century that we really open up set-top boxes. Because the General Lady's time has expired. That. Thank you. General, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson. I thank the chair and welcome to our FCC commissioners. Happy birthday, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Rosenworcel, did you have a chance to go by the County Line Barbecue at South by Southwest <laughs> out there on 2222? No, but I, I went to Salt Lake. You have to come back. <laughs> And Commissioner Pye brought up the NCAA March Madness, and our chairman did that as well. I'm a proud Texan guy, as I have to tell you, the Aggies from College Station, Texas A&M University, had the greatest comeback ever in college basketball. <laughs> Down 12 with 39 seconds left, double overtime, and moving on. So we'll play Kansas, maybe in Houston, for the Final Four. My first question is about privacy with you, Commissioner Pye and Commissioner O'Reilly. Um, the purpose of the NPRM is to get input from the stakeholders before drafting and passing a rule. Before. Input before. There are no conclusions. But the Texas I work for back home say this privacy initiative, this proposed rule, is full of conclusions. They say that's putting the cart before the horse. So my question is, are there? Tentative collusions in this NRPM for privacy. There are, Congressman. There are. Mr. Raleigh, are there conclusions? Yes, there are. There are conclusions. Is there a record basis conclusions upon something like an NOI, notice of intent, that was passed this year? Is there some NOI out there to base these conclusions upon? There is not. And I, what they're based upon, any clue? I can tell the people back home, yes, they're there, they got there, why? I, I can't tell you the motivation for any particular conclusion. The entire reason for this enterprise, it's important to remember, is that the FCC disrupted the work that the FTC had done. The FTC had regulated this entire ecosystem consistently for the past decade. Uh, having disrupted that with the net neutrality order last year, it's incumbent now upon the FCC uh, to formulate what the privacy rules will be in the internet service provider space. So, so I, to your point in terms of cart before the horse, here's a quote from an FCC staffer working on the issue. He said, in terms of precise information about how information is being used right now, I don't know that we have that. They don't know what's being used by the ISPs today, but we have a solution in the proposals. That's 
few back home say that does not up, that doesn't, well, I won't say what they will say back home, but uh, <laughs> one final question. Has the commission caught itself in a corner where to undo these, these rules, these new mandates, is that gonna be really hard to do when this rule comes out? Is, can we stop this or is it pretty much the trains left the station? I, I think unfortunately, uh, Congressman, uh, the commission is proposing to leave the station in a certain direction and notwithstanding what the American people might tell us after this document finally becomes public, uh, the agency's direction as you'll see is pretty clear. Yes, sure, Riley, any comments on that, sir? I, I agree, it, it would be challenged, I suspect to be challenged in court uh, and we'll see if they survive that, and barring a, a, a change in direction of the commission, I think they're- But people back home are so tired of having to go to courts to get the rules enforced the way they're written. They're just so sick and tired of going to courts. I wanna switch gears and talk about the, the upcoming Spectrum auction in rural Texas. It's one week away. And I talk about this issue, issue a lot back home with the Texas Association of Broadcasters, the TAB and they're worried about losing parts of their spectrum, not, spectrum not being compensated. Um, the towers may have to be moved, or, and that costs a lot of money. Um, the FCC has not given any assurance that they'll be fully reimbursed, especially in rural areas. The example they gave me was Amarillo, Texas, a decent-sized town, about 200,000 people in the panhandle. They have nine TV stations there, four Spanish language stations, four. They came here to D.C., met the FCC, and there were concerns were basically dismissed, said, don't worry, it'll be taken care of, I'll be fine. And if it's not fine, we got your back. That was not reassuring. Does the FCC have enough funds to cover rural TV stations if they have to build a new tower or lose their spectrum? Is there money out there to do that, or is that just a wish and a prayer? I'll answer it this way. I don't know the answer to that, and part of it is because we have a variable band plan, so we don't know how many people, are, you know, how much spectrum we're actually selling. We're gonna let the market decide some of those things through the good legislation. To so we don't know how many people are gonna be displaced. And so some of that will require a little bit of time to figure out. What I have said, uh, that I would be the first one here, if the 1.75 is not sufficient, to advocate that Congress reconsider this number. Thank you. Mr. Pye, anything to add about that, sir? Uh, I would agree with Commissioner O'Reilly, and I would just add that that's one of the reasons why I've consistently said that we should have treated the $1.75 billion as a budget uh, rather than a soft uh, suggestion. Thank you. About time, on behalf of Aggies everywhere, whoop! <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman yields back with a whoop, and with that, we recognize uh, the gentleman from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Yalman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here today and uh, for doing what you're doing to ensure that uh, there is access to broadband throughout uh, our country so that uh, everyone can participate in 21st century economy. Uh, come November, it's estimated by some that there will have been spent somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 billion on political advertising in this cycle. A lot of that's going to be spent by uh, entities, candidates, and uh, party organizations that are required by law to disclose their donors but a significant portion of it will be spent by uh, front groups that are under no requirement to um, disclose their donors. Uh, that's why Ms. Eshoo and I and six, 168 of our colleagues wrote to Chairman Wheeler asking the commission to use its authority under Section uh, 317 to require the, the disclosure of donors uh, for all of these front um, ads, front organization ads. And I have, uh, we wrote in January, I re received this response uh, dated March 10th from the chairman, and um, it's basically a thank you for writing response, something I, I don't think that you would believe that we would be satisfied with. And while I don't think that uh, necessarily we expected you to say, okay, we'll do that right away, I certainly expected more than this. And, and what particularly disturbs me is that when we talked about the, ba you, your, the basis for the commission's refusal to do it is based on their definition of editorial, using the standard of editorial, con uh, editorial control based on a 1979 interpretation by staff uh, as to what the standard should be for a sponsoring, to determine what a sponsoring organization is. And uh, you mentioned that in J January proceedings that you expanded the requirements to, 
cable companies and satellite providers and so forth as if that would be satisfactory to us. Uh, personally, I think that really is a further institutionalization of the deception of the American public uh, because this standard of editorial control is absolutely the most useless standard for the American people in trying to decide or trying to determine the credibility of political advertising. I spent most of my career in media prior to coming to Congress, and I have a little bit of an idea of what editorial control is. And in these situations, these groups, Americans for Puppies and Kittens, or Americans for a Brighter Tomorrow, they don't have editorial control. They may be crafting a message, but they don't have control of that message. So if you can imagine, uh, the American Petroleum Institute, they want to do, they want to form one of these front groups and fund it. Uh, can you imagine what would happen if the organization that they funded, American for a Brighter Tomorrow, ran ads saying, we need to do away with burning all fossil fuels? Those ads wouldn't stay up very long. They don't have control. They're doing what their funders want them to do. And that's why this is such a deceit that is being fostered on the American people. They don't have any idea who is saying that puppies and kittens are great. And until we get this kind of disclosure, billions and billions of dollars will be spent to deliberately deceive American voters. And I don't understand why the commission would not at least enter into a review of the standard they're using, you are using, to determine what is the most beneficial standard for deciding what a true sponsor is. Sponsor is who pays for it. And in this situation, those entities that are paying for it are not willing to be public, which is why they're using the facades that they're using. So in terms of the public interest, in terms of a vital and open democracy and a transparent democracy, I would, I would request First of all, I would reassert our, uh, our request to take action, but short of that, I would hope that maybe we could meet with, with commission staff to talk about this whole notion of editorial content and exactly what their perception is of, uh, I mean, editorial control and see exactly what their perception of editorial control is. Because as a former editor, I know who has control of the editorial process and I know who has control of the advertising process. And this would be like Coca-Cola saying, um, we're running an ad, pro soft drink ad, and you said, okay, they have to say paid for by Ogilvy and Mather or Leo Burnett or one of the advertisers agencies instead of Coca-Cola. So I hope you'll reconsider this decision and, and work with us to, to uh, do something that's more sensible. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back, Chair, and I'll recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinsinger. Well, thank you, Bye Chairman, now. and uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's like Christmas Day for you when you get to come before us, so appreciate having you. Thanks for your service. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Wheeler, we've had conversations in the past uh, regarding the rate regulation bill that I introduced last year, and at the time of our initial conversation, there was a lot of concern regarding the authority uh, your commission possesses, but chooses to forbear for the most part. Uh, in regards to rate regulation, and I appreciate the forbearance of that. I want to make that clear. Uh, during that conversation, we talked about putting into statutory law a phrase that would ensure yours and future commissions do not have the ability to set out retail rates uh, on broadband Internet, which I think is an important role for Congress to, to play, uh, to have a voice. But now, since the uh, time of our original conversation, you, along with many of our colleagues on this committee, have said that the bill I introduced is far greater than what it seems and that it could end the ability of the FCC to regulate a plethora of other activities that were not in the bill. And I understand those concerns, and, and I'm willing to work with anyone uh, that's willing to work with me to ensure that the intent of the bill is moved forward in a reasonable manner. Following a number of conversations and negotiations with members on both sides of the aisle, we passed what I think was an excellent amendment to the bill during our recent markup to ensure that a number of issues brought forward by our colleagues and yourself were specifically exempted from adding or detracting from the current FCC authority. Now, not more than a few hours after we passed that bill out of committee, you were in front of another committee in Congress where the same issue was brought forward. In that hearing, I have the transcripts actually, you again stated that we will not regulate broadband rates. Again, I appreciate that. 
And you then said that you would be willing to offer your assistance to Representative Crenshaw in developing legislative language on this topic. Uh, more specifically, you agreed to provide them with language and assistance within a couple weeks from the date of that hearing, which was uh, March 15th. Uh, would you be willing to provide that language to our committee when it's completed, which will be around March 29th? Yes, sir. Okay. I'd also uh, want to clear something up. In our recent markup on H.R. 2666, a letter from you was entered into the record in which you go to great length to explain why my bill is inconsistent with your comments before a Senate approves committee. Uh, given that I read you the text of the bill before it was originally introduced, and you stated that this is what we're trying to accomplish, I'm a bit confused by your letter, so I just want to clear something up. This is, this is just yes or no. Do you believe that the FCC should have the authority to regulate rates after the fact through enforcement? Yes, sir. Okay. What I was talking about was the question of de-forbearing. Okay. And I believe that in the open Internet rule, as we did, we should forbear from rate regulation. But you believe that you should have but the I authority to regulate rates, even though you choose not to at this time, the commission sh should have that authority to be able to regulate broadband rates. Yes, sir. That's is, kind of is, inconsistent. It is throughout. It is th because, look, because here's what's the concept. So, for instance, you know, Chairman Walden's amendment that you just, you just referenced, yeah. the, the amendment to your original idea, when she said, hey, this will not have any impact on paid prioritization, because obviously, well, so, if no, so, something and, and is here's paid, my, there I, is a rate being and I charged, appreciate, right? And I appreciate it, and we're willing to work with you, but what, what I'm kind of confused about is we went from you saying, hey, we're going to forbear it, we have no intention of regulating rates on the Internet, and I'm, I, I like the, the concept of what your bill is, even if you don't like the details. We're willing to work with you on the details, but you're saying that you actually disagree that you actually should have the ability to regulate I'm trying broadband to, that, rates. That's what I'm trying to, to address, the, the, the issue of rates. So, for instance, a, as Chairman Walden's amendment said, well, um, paid prioritization could be rate. That's not what we're talking about. Throttling could be rates, and we've all agreed we don't want to do throttling. Because how do, you, how do you throttle? There is a rate you are paying. You are delivering less than, than the service that you say that you're going to offer. Therefore, so there is a rate impact. And I understand Same that there's a lot blocking. of details. Same thing with blocking. There's a lot of details. But we went from you saying, I agree we should not be able to regulate broadband rates, to now saying we should regulate broadband rates, but I'll forbear it for this moment. There's details, and that's my point so is, we're willing to work with you on a lot of these details, um, yes, sir. And, and we're happy to do it with the other side of the aisle, with you all, and uh, and I think that's important. But maybe we made a little uh, headlines. Uh, to Commissioner Pye, do you believe that the open internet order leaves open the ability of the FCC to regulate rates in any fashion after the fact? And do you believe that Congress should act? Uh, yes and yes, and I think the chairman's commitment uh, should be taken at its word uh, that rate regulation is indeed on the table, and I don't think. It shouldn't be that big of a leap if the president has said when he instructed the FCC to adopt Title II, I don't want the FCC to regulate broadband Internet access rates. The chairman says, I don't, have a, I don't want to regulate broadband Internet access rates, and I don't have a problem with Congress codifying that. There should not be an objection when Congress actually tries to codify that commitment. That's right, and that's the role of Congress, is to make these laws, to make these things that we want our folks to live by or not live by. And uh, it's, I'm, I guess I'm confused, but unfortunately I'm out of uh, time. Thank so you. thank you all. Thank Thanks for being here. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. And I recognize now Ms. Clark from New York. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Wheeler, and to the entire panel of commissioners seated before us today. Um, my time is short, so I want to get right to my question. Mr. Chairman, as you know, some of my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and I have expressed our concerns about the potential irreparable harm the set-top box proposal could have on small minority programmers, content providers, and broadcasters. This concern was also expressed recently by Adonis Hoffman, a former chief of staff to a Democratic FCC commissioner, and I quote, <clears throat> If the FCC adopts the Wheeler proposal in a final order later this year, it will embed a regime that creates more, not fewer hurdles for smaller players, new entrants, and minority content providers to pierce the silicon curtain, end quote. 
Mr. Chairman, you continue to assert that you don't believe that this disruption will harm or limit minority and independent programming. So has the FCC gathered evidence to this effect? Has an, a disparity study been conducted to surface the unintended consequences of this proposal for programmers whose viability is not only driven by increased viewership, but also proven business models? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, the, the entire NPRM is designed to elicit this kind of information and then to, to collect that information in the first round and then to have a rebuttal to that information or adding Okay, on so there's been no study, no. No, but what okay. I'm saying is that's the process that okay. we're doing, collecting that right now. So I've asked the Congressional Research Service to perform a study on the impact of this set-top box proposal on small and minority programmers and content providers and broadcasters. I consider this a, a reasonable uh, request. Uh, would you consider delaying the rulemaking until the report is completed and to work with the committee to address any concerns that may be raised by a, a report? Well, we would look forward to working with you and the committee uh, on, the, uh, on any issues that are raised in this, and as, as you and I have, have discussed previously on this. So y you would consider a delay? I'm, I don't know how long the delay would be, ma'am. Okay, we can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, I want to commend and congratulate you on all your efforts on inmate calling services. It has meant so much to so many families across our nation, and I know it will happen. I, I have a question about the modernization of the Lifeline program. I'm hearing from many constituents that they are concerned with the portion of the proposal that would start charging for services that have been free for years. I think that's been a constant, a consistent theme here this morning. Would you further explain the proposal on the modernization of the Lifeline program? Well, what um, we are attempting to do, and it, it was a very simple for me uh, objective, to ensure that the Lifeline program looks much like everyone else's uh, offerings and options and, and, and opportunities. Right now, it was, uh, it, it just goes to, to uh, finance voice services, and we believe in, in a 21st century uh, e economy, in a, a world that's um, insufficient. So we are still in a deliberative stage. Um, I have heard concerns, as I mentioned in my opening uh, a remark, from uh, uh, consumers that are concerned, particularly on the mobile voice uh, problem, um, a, a, a mobile voice, um, they consider it, it uh, to be a problem here. Um, but what I want to assure you is I'm going to take all of those into consideration because I want, as I have, the option to pay little, none, or more, uh, depending on um, uh, depending on my ability and what I want from the market, and that is what we are attempting to create. All price points starting <coughs> at zero. So, m so my question is related to the maintenance of the voice service for constituents that may not have access to high-speed broadband or may not want to adopt the modern technology because they are seniors or disabled or perhaps less literate. Is the FCC being too presumptuous that broadband will be competitively available to all Americans in the next three years as outlined in the agency's draft proposals? So I will answer uh, this, this way and more succinctly based on time. Mm -hmm. It is my wish that whatever your desire is from a communication standpoint, whatever your, your need is from a communication standpoint, that this is a program that answers your needs. Very well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady for yielding back. Uh, the chair now recognizes itself for, uh, for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, uh, recently I was shown a quote attributed to a former venture capitalist, you, regarding the FCC's regulation of what was then a cutting edge innovative service. And I quote, I would hope the commission recognizes that despite the fact that they have very capable and dedicated individuals, it is not smarter than the functions of the marketplace. In that regard, I would just point to the cellular industry. The reason the industry has reached the level it has is because the FCC was smart enough to know that they didn't have all the knowledge." End quote. So looking at the situation with Binge On and other products, you have a team scrutinizing them, notwithstanding the overwhelming consumer response. It sounds like now the FCC's Enforcement Bureau does have all of the knowledge, in your opinion. So 
What has changed at the FCC since you made that statement as head of CTIA? Well, far be it for me to challenge the uh, wisdom of that uh, previous statement, Congressman. The model that we built for the open Internet is based on Section 332 and what I was speaking about at that point in time. And the job that the Congress and the Commission did in saying it is a common carrier and here are the things from which you will forbear and that the responsibilities of common carriage continue to obtain. And just like the common carriage responsibilities of data roaming were applied to wireless carriers in the last several years, so too do we then look at other common carriage responsibilities that may fall out and be affected um, by Internet service providers? Okay, well, great, great. So it sounds like, sounds like your position has changed, that now the Enforcement Bureau does have more of the knowledge than the private market. Let's, let's go on to a second question. On your watch, and uh, one of our colleagues earlier said we, we're not really talking about your budget, which is what you're here to talk about, but uh, I'm going to segue to that. <coughs> On your watch, average personnel costs for employees in the Enforcement Bureau have grown faster than was the case under Chairman Janikowski. Uh, certainly average salaries for those in the Enforcement Bureau have grown faster during your tenure than was the case under your predecessor. How do you explain this trend toward higher spending? Um, you have given me a piece of information that I was unaware of, and I will be Good. Would you get back to us? Uh, yeah, Ever. take that question for the record. Thank you. We'd like to, to know that. Um, also, uh, Chairman Wheeler, the FCC has a matter of practice. Uh, as a matter of practice, sends a contingent of Enforcement Bureau field agents to the Super Bowl, correct? Yes, sir. Um, it's the job of these field agents to ensure that no harmful or malicious interference interrupts communications broadcasting or public safety. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, a group went this year, am I correct? This yes, past sir. January or February. I assume that given the task uh, that this team uh, is responsible for, they're made up of primarily engineers that can resolve those problems. Is that correct? I don't know the answer to that, sir. Okay. Uh, could you get back to us on that? Yes, sir. Um, did the chief of the Enforcement Bureau attend the Super Bowl as part of the FCC's presence? I don't know the answer this year? to that, sir. Would you get back to us on that? And do you know if any uh, Enforcement Bureau chiefs in the past uh, have attended the Super Bowl? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So there are three or four questions for you if you okay. would get back to us on those. Uh, sticking with you, Chairman Wheeler, but changing focus, as the head of an important agency, I'm sure you're aware of the challenges that have arisen in agencies and departments like the EPA, the IRS, and the State Department with respect to the use of non-official means of communication, often to avoid or evade things like the Administrative Procedures Act or the Freedom of Information Act and the Federal Records Act. Does the FCC have a policy that clearly requires FCC employees to comply with these right obligations, and how do you enforce that, poli that policy and ensure that personnel cell phones and direct messaging over social media platforms are not used by your employees to avoid the sunshine and openness we expect in a regulatory agency like the FCC? I'm sorry, let me see if I understand. You're, you're saying what policy do we have to make sure that you don't do business on private Yeah, emails? essentially, yeah. That's policy. Yeah. Do you have that policy? Yes, sir. What do you do to enforce it? Um, what kind of enforcement mechanism? We don't. Do you have we don't go spying on our employees. I'm sorry. We don't go looking at what our employees are doing. How do you enforce it? Uh, we have the rule in place, sir. And how do you, and so you don't enforce it. If there is a complaint made against the rule, I'm sure we would enforce it. Okay. Well, what I hear you saying is you don't enforce it. I yield back, and uh, mm -hmm. now I recognize Mr. McNerney from California for five minutes. I thank the chair. Um, concerning the ISP privacy proposal, Chairman yes, uh, Wheeler, uh, I believe that uh, consumers should have control over their data, uh, what they disclose, and how their data is used. Um, recognizing that the average internet users may not be aware of the multiple entities, such as the ISP and the websites, 
uh, to collect their data. Will your proposal ensure that consumers have an understanding of what entities are collecting their information? Yes, sir. How will you do that? So there are three legs to this stool. First is transparency, that it must be disclosed what information is being collected and then how that information is used when it is collected. The second is that you must be given choice <coughs> insofar as do you want that information to be collected and, and used. And the third is that that information must be secured so that it does not uh, end up violating your privacy by leaking out to some other source. Are you going to require opt-ins or opt-outs? Yes, sir. Part of this? Yes, sir. So the consumers will have to opt-in or opt-out depending on what they want? Any information that is collected by an ISP that um, may not be distributed to a non-ISP, in other words, may not be sold to an advertiser or somebody like this without the opt-in in consent of the consumer. Thank you. Um, data security is a critical element of the ISP privacy proposal, yes. at least in my opinion. Uh, one of the things you could do uh, is called out by uh, requiring reasonable steps, but what does the commission mean by reasonable steps? What does that constitute? So there have, it, there has, that is noticed by the absence of reasonable steps. I mean, the, the reality is that one company's solution may be as adequate as another company's solution, but what we don't want to do is to say, here is the black and white cookie cutter that everybody has to do. But for instance, let me give you an example. There was one company that, um, that um, uh, allowed uh, their employees um, um, to operate allowed is the wrong word, under, wh under whose supervision their employees sold the information for about 280,000 customers. Um, there must be a reasonable structure in place to prevent that kind of activity. So you don't believe in establishing a standard uh, through some process and then applying We, we establish the expectation that you will do it, but there are multiple ways that it can be accomplished. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding set-top boxes, uh, as you know, I wrote a letter to you with mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Barton and Ms. Elmers regarding the privacy issues uh, under your proposals. Uh, I appreciate you responded. We got that letter last week, although I have a few questions about the certification process. How would consumers go about raising a potential violation of self-certification or independent certification? So the enforcement exists as it does today under Section Excuse me, under Section 631, um, applicable to um, wireless carriers, that that is the expectation that applies. Their first um, uh, role of responsibility is the um, is the cable operator themselves, um, and the second is uh, an appropriate complaint to the FTC or the state AG. Um, but that we have the same level of privacy protections that get put in place <coughs> today with existing alternative set-top boxes such as TiVo and Roku. Well, then who would decide if a violation warrants a revocation? The revocation of the license? Of the certification. So um, the cable operator can make that decision, mm -hmm. um, and there can be enforcement action taken by the FTC or the AGs. Thank you, um, Commissioner Clyburn. I'm also interested in the, in the uh, lifeline, but in California, <coughs> our customers get a state subsidy along with the lifeline subsidy, <coughs> and yet some of our, our uh, providers are saying that even with that very, the most generous state, state subsidy in the United States, they're still not able to supply, provide the basic services that are, that are warranted. Do you see that? I mean, how do you see addressing that problem? Our universal service construct has always been viewed through a public and private lens. And we always knew that there will be certain limitations from a government standpoint in terms of um, allocation of resources, be it state or local. And so what we are attempting to do through our other initiatives and uh, conversations and partnerships uh, that we uh, are continuing to forge is to ensure that the market uh, has uh, options 
uh, that would be more in line with the affordability construct in which you laid out. Uh, so it's a continual work in process, and um, I think we're on a, a, a the correct trajectory to 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 marry and uh, close these five. So there may be copayments involved. Uh, what we always knew that nine dollars and twenty five cents from a federal. Um, coffer would not be enough in all cases to bridge the digital divide. And that's why it's so important for, as you mentioned, states like California who recognize that, who um, complement the fund uh, economically, and we're hoping for more interaction with the uh, uh, private marketplace to bring things closer to affordability for those who could use, uh, who need broadband the most. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Belarakis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel for their testimony today. I have a couple questions. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, uh, I understand that a lot of robocalls or automated text messages are an unwelcome part of modern lives and should be limited as they are now under the Telephone uh, Consumer Protection Act. Uh, but in some cases, cons uh, consumers, customers have a legitimate need and a real desire to receive important information from some businesses. For example, utilities may need to contact their customers with uh, information about outages, uh, repairs, service restoration, or other important service updates. Uh, this is especially true in a situation we, uh, we face in Florida when we have hurricanes and uh, tropical storms, so it's a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. I understand there's a petition from electric and gas utilities currently pending at the Commission to clarify that the TCPA does not apply to non-telemarketing uh, informational communication from uh, utilities to their customers. Does the Commission plan to act on this, or can you comment on the status of the petition, please? Thank you, Congressman. I'm unfamiliar with that specific petition. We're dealing with several uh, issues that come out of TCPA. I'd love to get back to you with an answer. Please do. Please do. Thank you. I, I, a second question for Chairman Wheeler. We recently had uh, FirstNet up here along with your uh, Public Safety Bureau. Mm -hmm. One of the things we discussed was a level of coordination between FCC and FirstNet on closing FCC field offices since the field agents play a critical role, I'm sure you agree, in resolving interference to public safety communications. Yet, I still don't have a clear answer to my question. Was there any consultation between FirstNet and the FCC about reducing the size of the field office presence. And a simple uh, yes or no. Would I don't be believe it. so, sir. You don't believe so? Correct. And that's probably a no. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge. All right. Yes. Uh, Commissioners Pye and, and O'Reilly, the market definition in the chairman's set uh, top box proposal seems divorced from the reality of how consumers watch video today. Uh, the, mi uh, the video market already competes for cons uh, consumers giving uh, numerous viewing options based on single programs, channels, or bundles. Isn't the FCC's market definition backward looking considering where the market uh, is going? What do you think? Uh, Congressman, I agree with that characterization. I can't put it better than uh, former chair uh, chairman of this committee, uh, Henry Waxman, who said just yesterday that this is a 20th century solution to a problem that the market is already solving on its own. I Commissioner O'Reilly, please. I Thank agree. You. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, for the entire panel. Is the Commission worried about all the automated uh, telephone dialing system cases being decided in court on a case-by-case -case basis? Should the Commission revisit the definition and help to bring clarity to the issue so that businesses can uh, have clearer guidance. Uh, we'll start with the chairman, please. We had a, thank you, Congressman. We had a large proceeding on that within the last uh, six or eight months. Um, and what we are trying to uh, cue to is the specific language that is in TCPA uh, that says that insofar as wireless calls are concerned, the, wire, the wireless subscriber has the right to determine whether or not you get called. Commissioner Clyburn, please. <coughs> so I, I interpreted your, and hopefully my interpretation is in sync with uh, the spirit of your, your question. One of the things that we recognize is that every situation is different, and we must have the capacity in t uh, when it comes to intake of those calls and complaints, which are huge, they're, they're uh, large in numbers, that uh, we have the capacity to compartmentalize them and address them. So how we look at them in mass, there are a lot of commonalities to um, uh, uh, many of these calls. 
and we will address them in, in such a ma uh, such a, a manner uh, that uh, uh, would be in sync with uh, with that. Thank you. Any other commissioner wish to comment? Uh, as the chairman alluded to, we did address auto dialer capacity in the summer of 2015 in our most recent decision under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. But if I could make one point, it would be a plea. This is a law from 1991, and one of the challenges that the agency has right now is we are taking all sorts of technologies that did not exist in the early 90s and trying to figure out how to fit them into this old law. We are, as a result, struggling with more robocalls for consumers and more challenging lawsuits for companies that never intended to be on the wrong side of the consumers they're calling. Commissioner Pai, uh, should the commission revisit the, the definition and help to bring clarity to the issues that businesses may have to advise? Without question, Congressman, but in the absence of the commission doing that, and I don't see any indication that it will, I think, as Commissioner Rosenworcel pointed out, it would be helpful for Congress to update the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. One of the, the strange situations we find ourselves in now is, that on one hand, having perverted the definition of auto dialer to include everything uh, more sophisticated than the rotary phone, all these legitimate businesses are now seeking a special exemption from the FCC from the TCPA's uh, strictures and the various class actions that are sure to follow. At the same time, the administration is exempting entire categories of favored uh, robocallers, such as government student debt collectors, the prison payphone industry, and others. They get a pass, whereas a lot of these legitimate businesses don't. That's an, un that's an untenable state of affairs. Commissioner O'Reilly. So I'll just say I agree. I think the definition was wrong at the time, and we should clarify. Thank you. You're back, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate Thank it. Thank the gentleman for yielding back, and the uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I give my remarks, I'd like to uh, just, along with many others, uh, send out thoughts and prayers to the victims of the tragedy in Brussels today, including a U.S. service member and four of his family members that were injured, and three Mormon missionaries uh, who were also injured, two of which I know are Jason Shavitz's uh, chairman of oversight and government reform uh, constituents of his. And another note, uh, note the passing of my predecessor's father, Roy Blunt's dad, Leroy Blunt, passed away last night. And I know that uh, a lot of folks had not heard that yet. And uh, I want to add to the accolades, even though he's not in the room, that everyone's been throwing out to Ray Baum today. And, you know, after he wrote Wizard of Oz, I thought he'd be done, you know. I thought, that, <laughs> I thought he could live off his residuals. But uh, uh, Ray uh, is a great great guy, and I was a, came to Congress from a different background than most. I was an auctioneer and a real estate broker for over 30 years. I'm a salesman, and a salesman has to be upbeat, optimistic, open, and uh, Ray, I've never seen him in a bad mood. He's always upbeat, optimistic, and open regardless of the challenge. I wish him the best of luck over at the NAB, and I just realized out in the hall that he is one week younger than I am. Now, I know you can't tell by looking <laughs> because I, I, I look younger than him, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> anyway, congratulations to Ray on his move. Uh, Commissioner Rosen Worsell, I want to commend you on your trip down to Austin, uh, promoting the broadband to rural areas, which is a very, very key uh, object or whatever that we've been, we've been working on that we need to work on. I, too, spoke in Austin and participated in a panel 10 days ago today on that very subject, on uh, delivering rural bro broadband to the rural areas, which uh, for the students and their studies and everything, it's critical that we get that done. So I just want to congratulate you on your trip to Austin to promote uh, the same thing. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, in the spirit of John Dingle, I'm going to ask you for uh, Yes or no answers to my questions. I've got a few here. I don't have a lot. But, uh, Chairman Wheeler, I'd like to focus this morning, or this afternoon, I guess it is now, on your treatment of television joint sales agreements known as JSAs. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, there's a JSA in my district between TV stations KSNF and KODE in Joplin, Missouri. And it was because of this JSA that KODE was able to buy Doppler radar, which at the time was obviously a benefit to the Joplin community, but in 2011, when the EF5 tornado ripped through Joplin, killing 161 people in a town of 50,000, 
So everyone knew someone uh, from that tragedy. When I ripped through Joplin, there wasn't much more important, anything much more important to my community than the Doppler radar, which tracked a multiple vortex tornado, stayed on the ground for six miles. And uh, the reason KODE, KODE was able to afford this piece of weather equipment was because of the JSA. Now, I've got to admit that I was pretty frustrated with the FCC when they made the decision back in 2014 to basically outlaw JSAs, especially when I saw firsthand the difference they can make to small and medium-sized markets like Joplin. Clearly, also in my hometown of Springfield, there's a JSA operating there. Clearly, many others in Congress had the same frustration, which is why last year we included a 10-year grandfather for JSAs created before March of 2014 in the omnibus spending bill. Chairman Wheeler, again, in the spirit of John Deagle, yes or no answer, were you aware of the passage of this law? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I thought that uh, when Congress passed the law, it would have been the end of the conversation on JSAs, but unfortunately, to my surprise, I see the FCC has decided to, the merger process, has decided to use the merger process to circumvent our recently passed law. In a number of instances, the FCC has not provided the law's 10-year grandfather to JSAs involved in a merger. Is that correct? Yes or no? No, sir. That's not correct. That is not correct. I'm aware that you like me to uh, explain? I'm aware that you uh, argue that there's long-standing precedent that gives the FCCs the right to modify new licenses. Have you read the language in the omnibus bill that grandfathers JSA? Yes, sir. Can you tell me if the omnibus language includes any exceptions to the tenure grandfathering of JSAs? It talks about licenses. Yes or no. Uh, it talks. It, it, Can you answer yes or no for me? Does let me let me repeat the question, yeah. and I'd like a yes or no. Can you tell me if that omnibus language includes any exceptions to the tenure grandfathering of JSAs? In the definition of license. Yes, yes or no? Can you give me yes or no? That's a simple question. Yes. Thank you. Did the language include any exception in the case of merger reviews or FCC precedent, yes or no? Yes. And in the case where the FCC precedent that conflicts with a federal statute, which, tr which uh, trumps, isn't the statute, it's in the statute, isn't it? The statute does not conflict. It appears others were as surprised as I was with your interpretation of the statute. Uh, the statute recently, the 12, 12 bipartisan senators representing a full political spectrum from Senator Schumer and Durbin to Senators Blunt and Wicker sent you a letter telling you the congressional intent of that omnibus language, namely to grandfather all JSAs created before March 14. And you are in receipt of that letter. Yes, yes or sir. No? Okay, I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel. Um, I am going to continue the tra uh, tradition that we are carrying on here of Congressman uh, Dingell. And Mr. Or, excuse me, Chairman Wheeler, um, as you know, I have legislation requiring the FCC publish any rule changes on their website within 24 hours, H.R. 2589. Transparency has been a priority for this administration, so I find it strange that some have balked at this proposal. To that end, I'd like to ask you a few yes or no questions. Does the FCC have the ability to publish rule changes online within 24 hours? Yes. They do. That, so you confirm that within 24 hours we will be able to publish that information at the FCC. You're asking the question, do we have the technical ability to publish within 24 hours? And your answer is yes, yes. correct? Yes. Thank you. Now, I, I want to move on to, a, to another um, <coughs> subject. Um, Chairman Wheeler, I've uh, been a little disturbed uh, to read about the FCC's, quote, anti-business bias in a recent Hill article. The, commission, the commissioner's job is to ensure that the communications marketplace is functioning to promote, promote benefits for consumers and not to be beholden to radical special interest groups. Are you really listening to the wide range of stakeholders involved in the FCC matters, or is there a real bias, as been pointed out in this article? Uh, yes and no. Yes, yes and no? Yes, I'm no. There's two, there were two questions there. 
There, one was, am I listening, and the other, is there a bias? Yes. So yes I'm, to you are listening, and yes, no I'm to listening. The bias. No, there's Thank a bias. Thank you. Okay. So in uh, 2012, uh, there was a white paper that was created, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to su to submit this for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, it was a white paper on video reform from one of these groups, a special interest group called uh, Public Knowledge. Um, which seems to indicate that you're listening to very few voices. I look at, at the executive summary and find that there are four recommendations listed here that you have basically initiated by your administration. And I'll, I'll go through a couple of them um, as time allows. One, the FCC should, should issue a de declaratory ruling that multi-channel video programming distributors goes on to say, may not engage in unfair methods of competition or deception acts and practices with regard to online video distributors. You're, you started at this process um, to, to that question. Have you not started that process? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, not, I'm confused. I wasn't chairman in 2012, and I'm, I'm kind of- uh, You were part of the FCC at that time, though. No, ma'am. You were. I was a businessman then. Okay, in Which twenty, but but basically the point I'm making is in this 2012. Not that you were there in 2012. This this white paper was generated in 2012. My, the point I'm trying to make is that you are adhering to this white paper. I'm I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm unfamiliar with that white paper. Okay. Well, then um, I will just point out then that um, this particular white paper outlined this particular um, suggestion. And you are following it on uh, on on which topic? Uh, okay, I will read it again for you. The FCC should issue a declaratory ruling that multi-channel video programming distributors, and it goes on to say, may not engage in unfair methods of competition or deceptive acts and practices with regard to online video distributors, and that's part of the white paper. You started this process with questions to that practice. Is that not true? I guess I apologize. An online video distributor. Okay, is let me. I'll tell you what. Let's let's leave that one aside. Okay. The FCC, and this is again in the white paper. <coughs> the FCC should begin a proceeding to determine which regulations ought to apply to OVDs that choose to operate as MVPDs themselves. You have begun uh, this rulemaking as well, have you not? Thank you. Um, I have uh, proposed and then have not. Yes or no? Yes or no? Have not moved on. Okay. Well, there again, I, I'd like to submit a couple more of the quotes from the white paper. We're submitting the white paper for the record, but, you know, Chairman, I'll be honest and tell you, I, I at this point, um, and after watching this process, I'm not sure exactly whose opinion you are. You are actually well, the um, you. taking. No, I, I my time is, is has expired, and this is very troubling to me, sir. This is very troubling, and I I think that that we need to take more time to acknowledge the fact that that you may be taking opinions that are truly biased, and that's very frightening to me moving forward. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did did the gentlelady want to specifically say what she wanted to add to the to to the record there? Your last comment. What, what I'll say is I, I just, I basically, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank you, um, I have a couple of quotes, and, and basically I'm, you know, I will ask for those yes or no answers. Without objection. In, so in written form. Thank you. The gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes Mr. Collins from New York. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, witnesses. It's almost this uh, three-hour hearing, I have to admit. I took a break and had lunch, so. <laughs> uh, but what would, what would be a hearing without the New York guy asking about pirate radio? So here we go. <clears throat> I don't think I'll take the whole five minutes, but Mr. Wheeler, you and I have had this discussion yes, back and forth. And so in, in uh, questions after uh, following the March 19 oversight hearing, uh, you were asked about uh, the report that uh, showed a decline in enforcement on pirate radio. Uh, and the, the question was, has any guidance or instruction been given by the Office of the Chairman or Enforcement Bureau to Commission staff not to enforce the statute or Commission rules with regard to unlawful operations. July 21, we did get a response, July 21, 2015, from you that stated 
the office of the chairman and the enforcement bureau have not given or instructed to the commission staff not to enforce the statute or commission rules with regard to unlawful operation i'm assuming you remember that yes sir ok so one week later july twenty eighth we spoke again in this hearing and i asked you if there was any truth to the reports to the suggestion that the f c c had actually directed field offices to step down and back away from an enforcement you responded and i quote i have heard that and you further added that any such command did not come from you okay, sir. so last december the existence of an e internal email within the enforcement bureau this was last december was disclosed that it that in October of 2014, the staff of the Bureau's Northeast region was informed that the FCC's response to pirate radio operation was being scaled back. And the Enforcement Bureau would not be issuing notices of apparent liability to the majority of individuals engaged in such unlawful behavior. So my question is, since that disclosure came forward last December, have you looked in to that directive? Uh, I have not looked into that, uh, which I maybe had, you know, was not compass metis or something at the time. If you've read that in the record, I do not remember that. Um, but I have taken serious interest in, uh, in pirate radio. Um, and about, I'm told that about 20% of the activities of the Enforcement Bureau are directed to pirate radio, that we've had about 130 enforcement actions last year um, that we uh, continue uh, on that. Um, and I would add my voice to uh, Commissioner O'Reilly's uh, comment earlier about one of the realities that we're finding here is that we need to get to those who enable it. We can't ju just pat ourselves on the back for playing whack-a-mole, that we need to get to those that enable it. And if there could be legislation that would address that and empower us to do it, that that Well, I mean, I mean, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, I would like if you could look into that directive and get back to our committee Thank you. Uh, who, that about who issued that directive. We'd like to know where that came from. Uh, the, but, but also, the recently... The email does not say. I'm, I'm sorry. I've just... Does the email... Is there an email? I, I don't have the details. Okay. I, I will um, stop at that. But, but real quickly, my last minute. Uh, you just mentioned uh, the need for congressional action uh, to take, take on the, uh, uh, you know, the landlords and the others right. that might be, be behind the scenes working on this. But by the same token, there was recently released from the FCC an advisory notice from the Enfor uh, Enforcement Bureau that stated that the FCC already has the ability uh, to take FCC enforcement against those individuals. Y your own bulletin said that. So I, I, I think it's a bit disingenuous to say you need congressional action when your own Enforcement Bureau regulation says you've already got the authority. Uh, we would love to come back to you and be able to specifically identify the legislative authority that we're talking about. Well, but I but your own enforcement people say you've already got the authority, I, so I, I would I think, encourage you to I think that the, that the question forward. is what is I, the extent of that in, in my last ability. 12 seconds, because I don't want to hold this over, I just also want to ask the very direct question, because it's been suggested mm -hmm. that senior managers of the Enforcement Bureau do not want to shut down pirate radio operations because they serve certain communities, uh, certainly within New York City, that might not have otherwise access to that. Is there any truth in that? That would be wrong. And so there's no truth in that. And it would be wrong. It is news to me. Okay. Well, I appreciate that uh, fairly direct answer. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. And uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Ms. Eshoo, for the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a unanimous consent request uh, to place into the record a compilation of documents. Um, uh, the documents include press reports documenting that broadband investment has not decreased as a result of the Title II reclassification. The documents also include an analysis of SEC filings and earnings reports of the major telecom companies uh, similarly showing 
that broadband investment has uh, not decreased, and uh, also a letter um, uh, relative to broadband privacy rulemaking, which uh, all of which we have shared with uh, uh, with your council, and uh, ask that these uh, be. Um, uh, placed in the record. Without objection, so thank ordered. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I remind members that they have 10 business. First of all, I want to thank the panel for being with us today. Thank you very much. I'm not used to sitting in this chair, so I almost <laughs> forgot that part. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on April 6th. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you.